to the new day of the B-School. So I know that you are tired since yesterday we had the social dinner, but today is a very important day of this school with two important speakers that I'm really glad to have you and accept our invi in the, um, invitation. Let me just first uh, make an announcement. Since uh, just yesterday I, I knew that Edmund Berenstein passed away, it was one of the founding fathers of molecular simulations, we, d we decided to dedicate this morning session to his memory. And also the first speaker of the day that is Helmut Mueller will dedicate some words to his memory. So it's my pleasure to introduce you Professor Helmut Mueller <coughs> from uh, Germany, from Max Planck Institute of Göttingen. And uh, I don't want to take more time uh, because I will, I'm really eager to, to attend and uh, to see the lecture from Helmut. So Helmut, please, the stage is yours. Thank you for coming and we are here for you. All right. Yeah, m many, many thanks to Giulio for a wonderful organization of, of the whole school here. I already started enjoying it, and I'm sure I'll enjoy it the rest of it perfectly. It's a wonderful place, and uh, uh, it's really great to be here. Thanks for getting us all together here. Um, before I start, I would like to uh, also uh, acknowledge the work which, uh, which I'll present today. None of that has been done by myself. And I will uh, list the names as they come along. Uh, of, uh, that's the whole department, by the way. And I should also convey apologies uh, by Bertie Kroth, who really wasn't able to come here. He would love to come here, uh, but he, he just was not able to do that. Maybe next time. Um, all right, so as you already said, uh, before we start, I would actually really like to uh, give tribute to Hermann Berenson. Uh, as you said, he passed away last Monday. And uh, I, I think it's really safe to say that uh, the field of molecular dynamic simulation, the whole simulation field, would definitely not be where it is today without Herman. And uh, so I should also probably say personally that uh, he was one of my heroes, uh, one of my role models, if you want, because he combined in his personality uh, very clear and sharp thinking with a very modest and uh, sympathetic personality and helpful. And uh, if you know a uh, few of his students and, and uh, who, many of whom became professors, you can probably appreciate how much he promoted not only science, our field, but also the people of our field. And he created a huge school. And it is the spirit which I very much admired and try to follow also a bit. And uh, so I think that is uh, a great loss to, to all of us. Um, maybe one quote which I received yesterday uh, by, by David van der Spool, which is probably very, very uh, accurate by saying that Hermann Berenson and, and Wilfried van Gunsteren, uh, together with the Nobel Prize winners Michael Levitt and Martin Kaplus, were involved in the start of the field of molecular modeling. And I guess this joint mentioning with uh, Martin and Michael is, is quite appropriate because, frankly, I hope I don't, don't run into problems now because this is streamed, but uh, frankly, I, I really think that Herman would also have deserved the prize pretty well. And so uh, I guess that quote reflects that nicely. All right, um, what I will do is I will give a short introduction. You all know already what molecular dynamics is about. You all know Gromax. Uh, you should know that actually Gromax goes back as well as the force field Gromos goes back to Herman and Wilfred. And uh, what I try to do is to look a little bit more in depth behind the uh, assumptions and approximations uh, for like 10 minutes or so, uh, which underlie our method. You, I'm, I guess you have heard that there is a force field and you just solved the Newtonian equations. I would like to look very briefly a little bit behind the scenes and go a little deeper. To that, it would be perfectly helpful for me to know um, what's the composition of the audience here. So who's a physicist? Yep, the majority. Um, who's a chemist? Many chemists, I guess. And biologists all around? Okay, I try to do it with pictures. Um, so um, that's good. Did I miss mathematics, informatics? Informatics, I guess, right? Computer science, great. So that's a great mix. And uh, I try to adapt a bit to that. What do we want? 
we want to understand proteins, and we want to understand them in a way which is quite different from how we actually, um, as physicists, I'm a physicist myself, uh, try to, uh, also chemists, try to understand things. We try, we are brought up by trying to understand things in terms of properties. And the additional ingredient which we have with proteins and, and other biomolecules is they have a function. And therefore, we have to learn to, to also understand function. And that's what most of our field is, is about. And I think if you just want to memorize one sentence, um, I would suggest to memorize that sentence, proteins are actually nanomachines. And I give you uh, just one example right away, which I will not talk too much about today, but you, you may know the FADPase, that's a protein in your mitochondria, and it synthesizes from a proton gradient, uh, pH gradient across the membrane, that's the inner membrane of your mitochondria. Uh, driven by that gradient, it synthesizes ATP. And you all know that from, from textbooks or school. What you may not know probably is that it actually synthesizes about 70 kilogram of ATP in each of you per day. That's a really lot, their own body weight. And, and that's your fuel. And so uh, I think you cannot overestimate the importance of that machine. And it's a really wonderful prototypic machine in, in that, that it really conveys and implements its function by relatively large scale conformational motions. Specifically, this stalk here actually rotates. Uh, I found that utterly amazing when I had heard about that first time. Actually, Wolfgang Junge was the first to really prove that. And later on, um, a Japanese group. And it rotates actually inside this, uh, or relative to this uh, dome, globular domain, uh, alpha three, beta three. And it is actually this rotation which transmits the energy from here to here. I find that a, a wonderful example of a machine. And the rotation is about 10 to 100,000 revolutions per second. So that's a bit faster than your drill at the dentist. And it synthesizes the ATP with close to 100% efficiency. And that is one example where I immediately got curious, how does that work? How does this thing machine uh, achieve its, its high efficiency. And actually, without going too much into detail, it is very, very similar to an auto engine of your car, uh, if you happen to have three cylinders. Um, so the, the stock here is actually a crankshaft, and the motion of the pistons, in, uh, of the cylinders in the piston, is actually a motion, a conformational motion of this lower part of the alpha beta. The only thing which distinguishes it from your car auto engine is it rever can be also reversed. So Normally in your body, it synthesizes ATP. It can also be driven by ATP. You feed it ATP, and then the stock rotates. That's about also what your auto engine does. Your auto engine is not reversible. I tried it out to push my car. No fuel came out of the uh, exhaust, so that doesn't work. Um, but this machine, because it's high efficiency, is also almost reversible. And it's very small. So how do we go about and try to understand these machines. One way is, of course, to do crystallography or cryo-EM. But the problem is, you, you see a lot, but just not the motion with this. Another way would be to look at it spectroscopically. Then you see only the motion, but you don't see what actually moves and how. And I would claim there is still no experimental technique to really see a molecular movie of and to really see and understand how this works. And, and that's where our simulations really come very handy. And, and that's one of my main motivations why I really like, like to, to go into the simulation field. Another machine which I will uh, talk a little bit, if time permits, is actually the ribosome. This is not a simulation. That would be great. That covers like a fraction of a second or so. That's still out of reach. Um, but uh, you can probably see uh, that's a ribosome. And you can see the, the huge dynamic uh, which is involved in the translation process of, of the ribosome. And I, I will get back to, to that one. These, these guys are tRNAs, and uh, they, they walk along through the ribosome, each of them delivering just one amino acid to the growing nascent chain of, uh, of the new protein, which is synthesized in the ribosomes. For biochemists, I'm aware a ribosome is called rock solid compared to other more fragile uh, molecular complexes. But rock solid is a bit uh, relative. Yeah? It's still very, very dynamic. Um, question? No? OK. So what we love to do is we would like to watch these as they are alive, as they work during life processes, like this wonderful eagle here. 
um, that would be reality and that's what we would like to see. And just maybe to get you a bit awake after a wonderful dinner yesterday, um, so what crystallography does, and that will bring me into trouble again, uh, is about that. It's not really the eagle. That's a bit unfair, I have to admit, um, but it kind of conveys probably the message. And also, if you do time-dependent uh, X-ray crystallography, you can do that. Maybe that's a bit like that, then, but still doesn't really convey the flying eagle. Um, new times, you know that there's this revolution of resolution of cryo-electron microscopy, um, which is great, actually, and, and we, our field also profits a lot from it. It's not still not exactly what we want. Um, AFM, atomic force microscopy, would be about that, maybe. Uh, and that is molecular dynamics simulations as we dream of them. But that's not exactly uh, how they are. Unfortunately, that's what we would like to see, a wonderful simulation. But our simulations, even in the year 2019, and that's true for the last 50 years, is a bit like that. Yeah, that's our main problem. So it's not that we can cure every problem. We always, our simulations are still always too short. I guess that will be true also for, for the near future. Um, I guess that's kind of a, uh, a way to look at it. So you have seen already a number of simulations. You have seen free energy calculations, I'm aware, and, 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 and other great stuff. Um, as I said, I want to go a little bit back to the beginning. Um, you have seen what, what you have to do is you just have to tell the computer where every atom sits. And then you have to tell the computer the interaction forces. And you have learned about the force field. You have learned how to use it in Gromex. And you have seen probably what components are there in the force field, like electrostatic uh, Coulomb interactions, which uh, pose most of the challenge of the simulation in terms of computer time, um, Pauli repulsion, chemical bonds, which are here symbolized as springs, because we do treat them as springs, though. Uh, they cannot be broken in our force fields which we use and so on. Um, what I would like to show is, now don't, be, don't run away from, from math, um, but I, I would like to show where that comes from, just this one slide. And actually, if you think about it, uh, it's very puzzling that we solve the Newtonian equations of motions. After all, I think at school or at, in physics or chemistry, we have learned that atoms are intrinsically quantum mechanical objects. So why can we actually solve the Newtonian equations, and why does that reproduce reality? That's quite of a miracle, almost. What we would love to do is actually to start with a Schrodinger equation, and not only with those Schrodinger equations chemists know, uh, the time-independent one, but with a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. That's this one. That's what we would like to start with. It's a very compact equation, and in fact, the Hamiltonian here is very simple. It just contains kinetic energy of nuclei and electrons and the mutual Coulomb interactions, nothing else. So it can be written down very, very compactly and, and very easily on a sheet of paper. But to solve it has been achieved today with today's computer power, maybe for three, four atoms, but not more. And the system I showed before has 100,000 atoms. We can go up to 10 million these days. That's not really exactly close to what we would like to do. And so we just have to give up solving the real accurate equation which we would love to solve. And it is so far away from what we would like to do that we not only need one approximation, but three steps of approximations. I would like to just mention them. The first is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which just tells us that the nuclei being more heavier, much more heavier than the electrons, move much more slowly. And the electrons kind of instantaneously follow the motion of the nuclei. And so what you have to do, or what you can do, is to just uh, pertain that, that the nuclei are frozen for a moment, and then calculate what the electron system would do, what, or more specifically, what the ground state wave function of the electrons would be for the, just at that instance of time, configuration of all the nuclei in their Coulomb field. And once you have that, from that you can calculate the forces on the nuclei, and then you propagate the nuclei a little bit, and then you repeat this idea and, and see how the electrons now follow this small change of the nuclear position. That's the, that's the basic idea of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, to separate the fast electronic and the slow nucleic time scales. It's actually the, the most important approximation. And it, it holds to quite uh, good accuracy, except 
if the ground state and the first excited state become degenerate, then this approximation breaks down. Now, if you do that, then you, as I already mentioned, then you have two problems left now. You have one problem to solve the Schrodinger equation, now the time independent one for the electrons, and the other problem is to propagate the nuclei motion. So that gives you, out of one equation, two equations. Great, so where, why should that help? Why should we get uh, faster when we have two equations? Well, the first equation would be now the time independent Schrodinger equation. That's much, much easier already than, than this guy here. So that's a big simplification. Um, you know all that equation, I think, from the textbooks, except that here we have here this capital uppercase R. That's the position of the nuclei. The lower case is the electrons, and uh, th those are the dynamic variables here. And that each capital R gives a different ground state free energy of the electrons, and the gradient of that gives forces. So that is the time independent Schrodinger equation which you would have to solve every integration step if you want. And rather than solving that every integration step, what we'd like to do is to kind of tabulate it beforehand for different stereochemical configurations and then just try to fit a function to this table and use that function instead. It's just a fit function. And, and that is nothing else but the force field. So I think what I would like to convey here is the force field doesn't just fall from heaven or so, uh, some mix of interactions, but it conceptually actually is, is a fit function to the ground state energy of the electrons for any given nucleic position configuration. So that's, that's what a force field ideally, I should say, should be. And because that's a very high dimensional function, of course, it's a challenge to find a good fit function. And that's why we all have this struggle of finding a good force field and why we are still working hard to improve it further and further. All right, and so that's the second approximation, von Oppenheimer, force field. And the third one is actually to not solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for the nuclei, which would now be the rest to do, but to replace this time-dependent Schrodinger equation for the nuclei by the Newton equation. And that's, in my mind, the most brutal approximation which we do, and the surprise is it works wonderfully well with very few exceptions. And I can only sketch two reasons which I think why it works so well. Um, it cannot be the masses because the masses are very small. So, but it, I think it is the high temperature. Um, so if you are at body temperature or so, quantum mechanical effect it are not so large. And secondly, the fact that we work in condensed phase. And I guess that's the main thing here because that means that every coherence in a protein or so, every coherence in, in the nuclear motion gets destroyed very, very quickly by just the noise exerted by, by the environment of, of each atom, if you wish, of, or each degree of freedom if, of the protein. And I guess that's the main reason why this approximation works so well. Um, if you think of liquid helium, that's a superfluidic state at one Kelvin or so, our approximation would completely break down. So I guess the high temperature and the condensed phase, that's what makes this approximation surprisingly good. And these are the three approximations which we use. And I think it's good to always be aware of, of these approximations when we carry out molecular dynamic simulations because each of those uh, sets us limits which what works and what doesn't work anymore. And maybe finally remark, uh, because I think it's not so much uh, discussed here at that school. The second approximation, the force field approximation, that can and is actually be dropped today, uh, particularly if you want to st study biochemical reactions, breakage and formation of chemical bonds. I mentioned the our force fields can't do it. Um, it's not an intrinsic property, by the way, of a force field that force fields principally cannot do it. It's just that our Gromos, Amber, Charm, and so on force fields can't do it. Uh, and therefore, we resort to exactly solving that equation, mostly by density functional techniques and mostly in the vicinity of the chemistry which is actually going on in our system, for example, at the active site. And this is then called QMMM, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics approaches, a very powerful approach to study um, enzymatic catalysis. But that's not the scope of my talk today. I think it's not been touched too much. It's that school here. So that might be another school probably challenge. One more word 
on the history, I think the first molecular dynamic simulation, if you want, has been carried out by these guys here. And I think at least Fermi, you will probably know, he was involved in the Manhattan Project also, and uh, you know, also of course, fermions and, and bosons. Uh, and so that, that guy um, and, and the two others, uh, you, you notice it's a, a little bit later after the Manhattan Project, it's still in Los Alamos, uh, and they had a huge bunch of, at that time, supercomputers uh, available, uh, and they used it, of course, in the Manhattan Project. But then after, uh, they didn't have too much use for it, and so they just played along with them. And one of the things they did is they considered a chain of, of mass points, one-dimensional, connected by springs with, which are nonlinear. You know, if they are linear, everything is boring, can be solved analytically. But as soon as you make these springs nonlinear, things become exciting and you cannot solve it and analytically anymore. And so they solved it numerically. And I think this is, as far as I can dig into the literature, that's actually the, the first molecular dynamic simulations ever carried out, if you want. And uh, at already at that time, they were, if you read the paper, fully aware of convergence issues. So already then they said, ah, too short. Yeah, always. And, and that was obviously quite true. Um, the paper I tried to get, it's not in the journal, it's in the Los Alamos library. I, I tried to get it, I, I wrote them an email, and I wrote back, uh, sorry, classified. Uh, you can't, we can't send it, it's still classified. <laughs> Probably you, you build a nuclear bomb or something from these important results. And so I Googled it and got it in five minutes, it's easy. All right, maybe one more kind of conceptual picture which might help you understand what we are doing when we carry out molecular dynamics is, is this, uh, surprisingly. So, so that is Cassini, a, sp a space probe, uh, which delivered wonderful uh, pictures from Saturn and, and its moons. And uh, the algorithm to, to calculate the, this complicated trajectory of, of the space probe, or of Apollo if you want, um, is exactly the same. Uh, just propagating Newtonian circulations under the influence of forces, mutual forces between the bodies. It's just exactly the same. And if we do that, for example, for a uh, very simple uh, argon gas, like here, um, then you can see uh, phase transitions, you can see uh, the dependency of pressure on volume, you can extract that all from from such a simulation that's just 200 atoms in a box, and we're cooling it down when, when we do this movie here, and you can see that it uh, coalesces into small droplets, and we have a coexistence of droplets and, and gas state. You can clearly see in the droplets you have self-diffusion, so everything wobbles around and moves around in, in this droplet, and when we cool further, then the gas becomes more and more diluted, uh, and at the very end, if you lo watch closely, you can see the whole thing kind of arresting into a crystal suddenly. So we have the liquid solid phase transitions also captured. And as soon as uh, Johnny also comes home, uh, then we can also see a, a wonderful crystal here at like 30 or so Kelvin here. And I'm bringing that up for two reasons. One, I would like to encourage all of you to write code of, of that yourself. So today you will use Gromex, of course, so today you probably will not be able to do it. But uh, essentially I've told you everything you need to know. You, you just have to solve the Newtonian equations. You will have seen already the Verlet algorithm, uh, which is the simplest one which you can use to, to propagate the positions and velocities, or leapfrog. And uh, you need a simple interaction potential, in this case a simple Leonard Jones, nothing more. Um, you can look up the tables in Van der Waals tables, uh, the, the constants, and the program, if you write it, is something like 20, 30 lines, depending on programming language. In Perl, maybe just one line. And so it's a very, very compact code, except the graphics, of course, but just the core to, to calculate this trajectory is very simple. And if you're really good, you can do it in half an hour or an hour or so. And so it's a, it's a nice exercise, and I think it, every student in molecular dynamic simulation should have written it once in his or her lifetime. Uh, a small code, real molecular dynamics by him or herself. And uh, that would be an example. So just uh, for, the, for the joy of it. If you do now exactly the same, and that's a simulation by Berti Groth, uh, very early one, um, then of aquaporine, then it looks a bit like that. You have seen several movies already. Um, actually, um, one of the exercises we'll do this afternoon, if time permits, maybe also we can look at, at that. Um, but I'll introduce you also to other exercises. 
Uh, I'm showing that also to show you, you can nicely see the self-diffusion of the water. And this was one of the early examples where the simulations actually were almost not too short. And the reason is what we have looked at, this is a water pore here in a membrane. You know membranes are water impermeable for, wat uh, for water. Um, so you sometimes you need to get water across a membrane, for example. Uh, if a blood uh, cell wants to squeeze through a capillary, it has to get water out of it. Water is nearly incompressible. And so there are these water pores, proteins, aquaporins, as they are called, in the membrane of the uh, red blood cell. And they can passively contact water. You can see here the water molecules spanning actually four chains, monomolecular chains. And, and the water goes through there with super efficiency, super permeability about one water molecule per nanosecond. And, and when Andreas Engel approached us with, with this protein, so he, he had studied that uh, in very much detail, um, then this one nanosecond, that rang a bell, right? We said, ah, one nanosecond, that we can do even like, uh, what was that, like 15 years ago. And we actually did multiple nanoseconds, multiple water passages. We, we could observe there's one of them. We just colored one water molecule yellow just to can follow here the the pass of, of the, the passage of the water molecule through the channel. And uh, when you do that several times, you can simply count in 10 nanoseconds how many water molecules pass by. And from that, you can uh, calculate the permeability. And I'm bringing that also up because that's one more very important principle, I think, when we carry out molecular dynamic simulations. I mentioned these three approximations also for the purpose to make sure you never believe a molecular dynamic simulations without good reason. It can always go wrong because one of the three approximations might go wrong, or you might even suffer from some simple bug in a program or bug in a setup script uh, or bug in an analysis script. So never believe a simulation without good reason. And a good reason is if you can calculate something which can be measured and it agrees. And if it does, then you can go on and look at things which cannot be measured, which is actually why we carry out the simulations in the first place. So try, please try to always calculate something first which can be measured, check against experiment, and then we are more on the safe side. And the permeability is one of those examples because that can be checked against experiment and it did agree pretty well for a rate. And also, don't compare just one number, try to compare several numbers because otherwise the agreement might be coincidental. And so what we did here is we implemented a few mutations and saw how they affect the permeability and asked our friends from experiment um, to also do these mutations and see how the uh, permeability changes. And also that were worked out pretty well. Um, so that was one of the very early examples of uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And maybe a, a note on the side because we have plenty of time today. Uh, we did a prediction there and it's maybe worth for the students here worth briefly contemplating why we think a prediction is more valuable than a post-diction where the experiment has been first. If you think about it, the only reason can be that people trust experimentalists more than theoreticians. Because if they wouldn't, they would say, ah, we should first measure and then calculate because then the experimentalists can't cheat. And here, if we just predict and then measure, then the theoreticians can't cheat. So it's just a matter of whom you trust more. And it seems that people trust experimentalists a little more. No comment on that one. Okay. So I was mentioning timescales and just a, a very short uh, glimpse on, on a kind of 15 orders of, of timescales or more. Um, I think we are about here today, simulating a few microseconds with super graphic cards um, is, is not a problem today. And, and this is just where we are about to enter the interesting stuff. Yeah, that a lot of biochemistry actually happens between microsecond and milliseconds. And uh, combined with all the tools which you have learned at that school, like free energy calculations, non-equilibrium stuff, et cetera, I guess that uh, makes these times particularly exciting to, to go into the field and to apply this field to, to answer questions which you can't answer otherwise. So that brings me to what I would like to discuss with you today. Um, if possible, um, or I'd like to start with uh, ligand binding and ligand unbinding simply because that closely relates to the main part uh, 
of our exercises. Then I will talk a little bit about ribosomes, which does not relate to exercises, but I think which nicely show what we can do with the method. Um, then I would like to discuss intrinsically disordered proteins very briefly because it shows the limits of our method. So again, to make clear that we shouldn't believe everything which comes out of a computer. And if times permit, I'd like to show a little bit ahead what might be a next step. Uh, and that has a flashy name, the dinosome. Uh, and at the very end, please remind me of that, I would like to pose you a riddle. And that riddle relates to my only paper I have with Herman Behrens. And so I guess that's quite appropriate also to, to, to show that today. Ligand unbinding. Why do we want to actually enforce mechanically unbinding of a ligand from its receptor? Doesn't occur in nature. Biologists would say, you're crazy. Why should you do that? Actually, we didn't dare to do that until Hermann Gaub and a few others in the mid-90s came up with a crazy, similarly crazy idea to, simul uh, to, to measure by atomic force microscopy, AFM, the force which is required to just drag out a ligand of a, uh, from a receptor of a single molecule. And that immediately struck my attention. So that is, that is something I found utterly fascinating, to measure force on a single molecule. And, and they were able to do that. That's one of the first results they got. And it, it shows that the force is in the several hundred, maybe 100 to 200 piconewton range. That's about the force the slide projector is here exerting on the screen here. So that's, that's about the size, just by light pressure, um, the force. So the, the idea is pretty simple. You kind of functionalize a surface with a number of these tetrameric uh, streptomidins. And the cantilever tip, which is just a small spring with a very sharp tip, is also, a, to that is attached a few of the ligands, biotin, which is just a vitamin. And uh, that molecule binds very, very strongly. So that's why they looked at it first. And then I approach the cantilever on the surface. A few of these bonds form. You can see that on the, on the force distance plot here. You push a little bit into the surface that goes up here. And then you retract the cantilever or the surface. You go down here. And you have a few complexes formed. And then when you retract further, one after the other ruptures, which you can see on the steps here. And eventually, the last one is the only one remaining. And if that ruptures from here to zero force, that's how you see that, of course, that would be the rupture force of one single molecule. So, so that's the idea. And of course, it is probably not quite aptly termed AFM uh, microscope, because all this is what, what the guys can see here is a rupture force. They can't see what's going on. And so that's where actually Herman approached us and said, well, you're doing the simulations. Can't you also look what's going on during this unforced unbinding? And yes, we can. Um, that was the mid-90s. And already at that time, we were able to do like 10 nanoseconds. And already in 10 nanoseconds, we were able to see uh, what actually goes on uh, during rupture. And that looks a bit like that. And this is what you will do today, this afternoon. So you will actually pull on, on a small molecule, exactly this molecule, biotin, out of streptomidin, and try to replicate what we did. And, and uh, there's more to the story, which I will explain in a second. But what you should probably see here is it's not as you might have imagined that there's a bound state and then there's a barrier and an unbound state, and it just choof, goes from the bound to an unbound state, two-state model, as it's very often described. It's much more complex. It has many intermediate states, and the ligand here kind of flicks from one intermediate state to the next on its way out of the binding pocket, while the conformational motions uh, always adapt, of, of the protein always adapt uh, to, to every motion the, the ligand does. So it's a very complex dynamics until eventually the ligand is out of the binding pocket and, and the maximum of the rupture force is reached. So you can also see this complexity in what we call a force profile here. So that's the force over time, which we actually measure. Whenever the ligand flicks out a little bit, the force drops and then the next force peak builds up. And many of those force peaks are actually reproducible and do point to the rupture of individual H bonds or hydrophobic contacts or also water bridges, where a water molecule is bridged in between uh, streptomidin and, and the biotin. And I invite you to really look closely into your simulations this afternoon to see also, for example, that if you do it multiple times, if you have the time to do it, uh, it's not the same always, right? You get different unbinding paths. And that's not an artifact of the simulation that also occurs in nature. It's such a complex system that you get different paths just by the stochastic nature of, of this process. 
and, and that is what I would like to invite you to, to look a bit at. Um, I've heard some of you love non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Me too, I love it a lot. Um, and uh, I also would say Chasinski and Crookes and others who have pioneered that field, they certainly deserve the Nobel Prize for that. Um, and if you know about that a little bit, if not look it up in Wikipedia, then you will find Chasinski's formula, which is connects the force here with a free energy. Or more precisely, from that force you can calculate a work by simply integrating over distance. Force times distance gives a work. And it connects this work to the free energy of unbinding. And I would also like to invite you, if you have time and, and, and if you are excited about it, to try to do this integral um, and see whether the work you get out is actually the unbinding free energy, which is in this case about 20 kilocalories per mole. So if you get that out, I would be very much surprised because you will find something which might surprise you. And then I would like to invite you to think a little bit why you got the result you got. Um, so if you want, look a little bit into that. So another reason why we were quite excited at that time to look at unbinding was that, again, we had the chance to compare directly simulation with experiment. And that is with a nice twist, because in this case, no single AFM experiment has ever been used to calibrate our force fields, any of our force fields. And so what that means is that we measure something or we calculate something and compare it to experiment, which is completely outside the original calibration scope of our force field. And I think that's a particularly valuable thing to do, whether to see whether also outside that um, our force fields are transferable enough to also calculate those things. And um, I'd like to show you the result which we obtained in the mid-90s here. So on the left side, are experiments by Hermann Gaub and Matthias Rief and others. Um, and what is shown here is the maximum rupture force. You remember the force profile I showed you before. As a function of how fast you pull. You, you can imagine if you pull faster, you need a larger force. I explain that in a minute. And if you pull a little slower, um, you need less force. In fact, if you pull very, very slowly uh, at the time scale of K off, which is, by the way, months here, so you have to pull really slowly, then you don't need a force at all because it then spontaneously unbinds. So that's if you go left and left and left, at the end of the day, you intersect the x-axis here. Now, that were our simulations. And they were, of course, uh, limited by how slowly we can go. And I should say this point at that time uh, took us like a few months of computer time on, on the largest computers, the T3E at that time, I'm afraid. Um, today you can do it in an afternoon or in a few minutes maybe even, and, and you will do it. But at that time that was the slowest we could do. And that, from the experimental side, they were limited. They couldn't do it faster because then they enter the resonance frequency of the cantilevers. And so what you can see here is we have a huge gap of six, or six orders of magnitudes. And it's not really possible to compare here. The best you can probably say is it, it doesn't disagree, right? Not obviously. So it might agree, it might not, uh, but at least it doesn't harshly disagree. Uh, that's all we could say at that time. And I'm showing you this to also give a bit tribute to, to how much the field has advanced in the past, like, 20 years or so, because we revisited that last year, and that's work by Andreas Rosek in my group, um, and we did it in collaboration with Simon Scheuring and Felix Rico, uh, in Cornell and, and Marseille, and, and uh, just to show you what comes out today. And before, I would like to give you a little bit of kind of poor man's non-equilibrium statistical mechanics to motivate why we see actually this line here, linear behavior, but notice the logarithmic scale. So that is a logarithmic behavior, actually, uh, which is shown here. Why is it logarithmic? And I guess that's also nice simple physics or physical chemistry, if you want. And let me go back to the simple picture of just the bound state being a minimum in the free energy landscape, or a potential energy landscape, doesn't matter. And uh, the barrier separating here the bound state from the unbound state. And that is just the distance of how the ligand leaves the binding pocket. Um, and in equilibrium, you would just have a Boltzmann example here uh, in this bound state, and that's it. Uh, but if you exert a force um, and you use a soft spring, then you would see that this is just a constant slope potential, which gives a constant force. Uh, 
And as you ramp up the force, the slope of this potential will increase, and that's the red curve which you can see here. Now, if you add together the red curve and the blue curve, you add up with a green curve, and that is now a time-dependent potential. And so that's where non-equilibrium comes in. And you can see it's actually it's still quasi-equilibrium. What you can see is that um, you don't actually reach the point where the barrier is completely vanished, but the ensemble here crosses the barrier already before. Why that? Because at some point, right now, the barrier is small enough such that at the given time scale, microseconds here, activate, the thermal activation can overcome the rest of the barrier. Very simple. Uh, so the unbinding rate, the K-off, at that point is for about microseconds, from hours or, or months to microseconds. And the rest is overcome. So if you pull a little slower, like milliseconds or so, um, you give more time for the activated process, and correspondingly, uh, a larger barrier is overcome in a millisecond, and the crossing occurs already earlier, which means that the maximum force here also is a little lower. And if you go to seconds or so, then almost at the well, the barrier is crossed, and you only observe very little force. Now, the Arrhenius factor, as chemists call it, or the Boltzmann factor, as physicists like to call it, um, is an exponential function of the barrier height. And so if you invert it and set the time and ask for the remaining barrier height, no wonder that a logarithmic function comes out. And that is exactly what explains that linear behavior. You might ask, why then does it bend up so much in the simulation? That's simple friction. We are too fast. So we are so fast that the ligand just st suffers from Stokes friction drag through the water and the binding pocket anticipates a lot of energy. And that's why it goes up then really linearly, which in the logarithmic scale, of course, shoots up. And that's what you see here. And that's actually why you can't directly compare those. And that uh, didn't leave me, me resting. Um, and I was quite happy that now our friends from the AFM field came up with much smaller Campy deliver with much higher uh, frequency, such that the left side of this gap could be uh, closed by two orders of magnitudes. And as you all know, our field advanced quite a bit. And we actually now got faster by like three to four orders of magnitudes in terms of computer power. And that enabled us to come up now with this plot. That's exactly the same plot as before with new data. And you can see here on the left side the data by Simon Schoening and Felix uh, on the AFM. And on the right side in green, this is our simulation data. Maybe I can't resist to say one more word. In the previous plot, each dot was just one simulation. A couple of months, you can just do one simulation. Uh, now each dot is 20 simulations, and that means we have error bars now. And I can't overemphasize the importance of error bars. Uh, don't believe plots without error bars. I have a few of them, so you may not want to believe them. Um, but generally, try to do error bars. Then you know whether a difference is significant or not. And in this case, within the error bars, I think the agreement between experiment and simulation is now really wonderful. And that also testifies the, the strength of, of molecular dynamic simulations, simulations outside the scope of the force fields, where no one has ever calibrated a force field uh, against. Um, I should say one word of caution. The direction of pulling is not exactly the same in the simulation and in the experiment. And that is because in the experiment, we don't have much control over, over the direction of pulling. And it's recently been shown that the direction of pulling is important. And so we will have to revisit that uh, to also get control over the direction of pulling in the experiment and to really have a one-to-one -one match. There's, so there's one piece mi still missing. Um, and so it may be that the story is not yet completely finished, but still I think that's a great result. Also on the right side, this is one rupture event, and you can see the simulation up here and really an experimental trace down here. It looks at least nicely similar. All right, one thing which you will not be able to study this afternoon, but I just mentioned, right? if you now analyze the many hundreds of unbinding events which we have at different velocities, loading rates from these simulations, you will find out, I mentioned these different intermediate states, that the sequence of intermediate states, on average, it's stochastic, but on average, changes um, with how fast you pull. For example, if we grab the four most pronounced intermediate states here, that's the bound state, and those are the four states, um, the stoichiochemistry is here shown a bit here, and uh, 
and then look how many systems go with what probability through these four states, then you observe the following. Here, red means pulling very fast, and blue means pulling very slowly, and the thick line means a lot of systems go through, th through this route, high fluxes, and the thin line means low fluxes. And you can see, if you pull fast, most of the system already branch off intermediate two to the unbound state, a few intermediate three, but very rarely through intermediate four. Whereas if you pull slower and slower and slower, more and more flux goes via this complex route, and that's a general rule. The slower you pull, the more time the system has to explore conformational states orthogonal to the pulling direction, and, and that actually um, uh, makes the unbinding path more and more complex. All right, so that's been published uh, quite recently, and uh, I think that's uh, a nice test uh, of, of our method, and also, um, brought about quite new knowledge on, on the complexity of this and dynamics of this unbinding process. Maybe one final word to show that. Um, also, as I said, we, we mistrust theoreticians, so it's all about predictions. We saw in some of our unbinding traces in the simulations, we saw an intermediate step before final rupture, very far out in the binding pocket. So the ligand already has almost unbound, but then apparently there is some remaining interactions which prevent it from complete unbinding. So there is a new state shortly before unbinding which hasn't been seen before, and it was clearly seen in our traces here, in red here. And that motivated us to, to talk to our colleagues, uh, to Simon and, and Felix, and ask them, please re-examine your data. Maybe you also find that in your traces in the experiment. And uh, yes, they did. So these are the experimental days, and you also see this intermediate state here very much on the outside. And there's more to it. We can, of course, go quantitative and, and ask ourselves, what is the distribution of waiting times, residence times, in how long do, do the systems remain in this transient state as a function of how fast we pull? And this is shown here on the right. Here's the force, and, and here's how long they, they remain. And Again, that's the experiment, and that's our simulations, and they nicely agree again. And plus, there's a wonderful, again, nice statistical mechanics model by Dutko and Hammer and Chapo. And if you fit that to that data, you can also see it agrees pretty well. So all gives a very nice round picture. And I'm showing that also to underscore the value of uh, also some theoretical treatment, uh, analytics and mathematics. We had a nice discussion yesterday on on, uh, on that, uh, I should say um, there's always this dispute between should we do simulations or should we do mathematics? Mathematics is the holy grail and always much better than simulation. I would claim do both. Try to combine it and then you get maximum information gain. Then you learn most if you try to combine both and that's I think also a nice example uh, underscoring that, that strategy. All right, what I would like to briefly mention on the side, and that's work by Martin Höfling and Nicola Lima in, in my group, um, is we also went on trying to simulate other single molecule experiments. That's kind of a, a red line which goes through my, my department to try to simulate single molecule experiments and as, as closely as possible to provide better interpretations and also to test the simulation models. And another wonderful simulation uh, single molecule experiment is actually FRET, single molecule FRET, which we did here in collaboration with uh, Klaus Seidel and Ben Schuller, where people probe the distance, for example, of these two lobes by attaching dyes, a green one, a red one, and the fluorescence of this dye, uh, of the two dyes, with respect to each other, the ratio of the two, depends on their mutual distance. So you can measure the distance via this famous Förster formula, which actually was developed by Förster in Göttingen, so where I come from, so that's a, a nice reminiscence. And the problem with that, however, is it's not so easy because the first transfer, this, uh, this quantity, does not only depend on the mutual distance of the two dyes, but also on their mutual orientation. If they are parallel, you get maximum uh, first transfer. If they are perpendicular to each other, then you get zero. And so what this first formula actually does is an average over all equally probable orientations. And that may well work in solution, but as soon as you attach a dye to a protein, you can hardly claim 
that all orientations of the dies are equally probable. For example, some of them are completely impossible because the die can't move inside the protein and, and stuff like that. There's interactions between the negatively charged die and the surface and so on uh, of the protein. And so you can't rest on that assumption. And that's where I think also simulations can help a lot. And so one thing which we did is to simulate this uh, dies attached to a very simple polyproline. That's actually the so-called molecular ruler invented or used famously by, by Stryer when he calibrated first the transfer a long time ago. So we redid that with a polyproline and try to see whether we can reproduce by considering an average over all orientations which at distances which we see in the simulations when whether we can reproduce experiments more accurately than with a simple first formula. So um, just very briefly we did the simulations and then we on top of that we used a Monte Carlo scheme for the photophysics of it which I don't go into detail it just rests on the on the full photo, uh, photophysics reaction uh, chain uh, and here we have a time dependent first the transfer rate depends on distance and orientation where we enter this simulation data. And the result is, um, to make a long story short, a histogram of efficiencies, right? The, the ratio between the emission of the two dyes, both in the experiment in black here and in green and red uh, from our simulations. And you can see, again, we get very good agreement just by doing the simulations without any fit except the, the force fields which, which we used. And why do we do it? We can use that to get better distance estimates from FRET experiments than without this approximation. And so in green, that would be the traditional way, kappa two third for the experts, um, which you get out. In blue would be the correct distance. And in purple, we would get what we, if we do it as good as we can uh, from our simulation. So we get right on top uh, agreement with the reference. And, and that also helps the field a lot to improve the interpretation of the experiments. You may have noticed in most of the papers which do FRET, they always talk about high FRET and low FRET, and they talk about large distance and small distance, and they never give numbers for very good reasons, because they are careful and, and, and they know about their limitations. And I think with, with that, if you add molecular dynamics to that, you can attach numbers to distances measured by FRET, and I guess that's quite a bit of an advance. I skipped that one. Uh, I, I wa didn't want to talk too much about ATPase because we are already a bit advanced in ooh, oh, half an hour. Yeah, in time. That's good. Sounds good. So let's move to a big machine. Let's go big. Uh, the ribosome. Um, to give you a few numbers, the aquaporin and also the uh, streptavidin. That's in the order of hundred thousand atoms. Is that true? Hundred thousand, roughly, a little less, maybe. Uh, so, so that's about a small system by today's standards. Um, the ribosome is also, by today's standards, relatively big. It has 2.2 million atoms. And I should emphasize here, we always do simulations fully atomistic and the ex with explicit solvent. So that adds up uh, to, I don't think uh, that implicit solvent gives too accurate results. So we'd rather spend uh, the money and the, the computer time also on the, on the solvent uh, to, to get good results. Um, so let's talk a bit about the ribosome, and I should mention that this last book, Christian Blau and Andrea Vajana in my group, in collaboration with a number of people. Uh, Holger Stark, I should mention first, because he, did, he was one of the pioneering guys to do cryo-electron microscopy. I'll show you data in a minute. Uh, Marina Rodnina does the kinetics and biochemistry, and we also collaborated with the people in Munich. Daniel Wilson is now in Hamburg. Uh, uh, so what does it do? As you all know, Ribosomes synthesize proteins from the genetic blueprint, which gets fed into them like a, like a tape by the messenger RNA here in red. And uh, to each triple of the messenger RNA triple nucleotides, there is a complementary triple nucleotides here on this side of the transfer RNA here. These are two transfer RNA. And there are a bunch of several dozens of different transfer RNA, each of them carrying, according to genetic code, exactly the right amino acids fitting to this triple um, to be delivered to the growing nascent chain here of the protein to be synthesized, which leaves the ribosome through a quite narrow and winding tunnel here. 
And that is the active site where actually the amino acid is attached to the chemically to the growing nascent chain. It's called the peptide transfer center, PTC. And the tRNA has three binding sites, actually, which are called A, P, and E. Here we see two occupied, the last empty. And what happens is actually during the cycle, uh, tRNA arrives and then moves over from A to P, where it actually delivers its amino acid, then to E and leaves the binding, uh, the ribosome, when the next one arrives. And there are on average always two rightly bound uh, at each time. So that's about how the ribosome works. If you want, it has two subunits. That is the machinery, the fabric, where, where the, the work is actually done. And that's kind of the computer, the head, if you want, the brains, where the recognition and the information processing, if you want, the, the translation of the genetic code is actually done. And that's called 50s and, and 30 years. Um, so what was so great about Holger Stark's data at that time was that he was, for the first time, able to resolve not to super high resolution like 10, 15 angstrom, but to resolve by cryo M, single particle cryo electron microscopy, um, several intermediates, not only one structure as it was typically at that time, but several intermediates. And that immediately prompted us to try and see whether we can get atomistic resolved or pseudo atomistic resolved models for each of those intermediates. Here you see a cryo M map uh, and you can about judge the resolution. And we fitted an X-ray structure which, which was available only for one of those 12 intermediate states into all the other densities and thereby to get a kind of a molecular, quote, movie um, of, of how actually the tRNAs move along. And we had a number of questions which we wanted to address with that. First question was, is that really a movie? Seems like a movie. But the way it's, it's done is you, you just have an ensemble of frozen molecules and you sort them into different classes according to structural similarity. And, that does, and then you just juxtapose them one after the other according to similarity. There is no time information there. There's just an ensemble. And so it's far from clear that the actual motion, the actual dynamics proceeds like this sorted number of structures. So that was not one question. Another question we had was, What's the time limiting step? And it was kind of common knowledge in the field that it must be the inter subunit rotation. I forgot to mention that those two subunits, the large and the small subunit, during the reaction cycle rotate with respect to each other by a large angle, like 25 degrees or so. That's a huge conformational motion. And because it's the largest conformational motion of the ribosome, and because it's separated by a huge interface, which makes it not so easy to, to, to carry out this motion, that's an exciting problem on itself. Because of those reasons, people thought at that time, this must be the rate limiting step. And we wanted to look into that, whether this is actually the case. And the third question which we had was, this blue guy here, which is called L1, that kind of caught our attention because it's highly mobile. And if you look at it, it kind of co-translates with the green tRNA, right? That's, by the way, a schematic picture of the same thing, which I will use later on. And so it seems to kind of literally grab the tRNA and pull it along, right? But does it? Next message to our students. I hope you know that correlation does not necessarily imply causality. I have a movie for you here, which I hope makes that clear. So just because things happen at the same time, correlated, doesn't imply that what you see is the cause of one of the other. What may he also, yeah, that's a nice one. Right? Um, what may be well be, of course, is that it's not the L1, which is the active agent dragging, exerting force on the green tRNA and dragging it along. It may be the other way around. It may be that the, L, uh, that the green tRNA is actually pushing the L1 along. It may also be that you have a third agent, which we don't know yet, which kind of synchronously drives the two along. So these are two th or three possibilities. And you w I would claim no way to find that out experimentally, just by looking at it. You will, never, you will only see correlations. You will never see forces or something. And that's, I guess, where also we can help to convert a picture, which is just a picture in terms of correlations, into a picture of cause and effect, and to work through the ribosome to see what ultimately is the driving force and which gears and levers drive and wheels drive which others. In short, to understand its function and, mechani and mechanics. And, and that is something which I would like to show you. And in order to, to address those questions, we started 
from each of those snapshots, and they cover a time scale of about a fraction of a second, we started from each of the molecular dynamic simulations, each 100 nanoseconds, large systems, so 100 nanoseconds is already quite a bit uh, shown here, and that's on the left side. So this, this is one of our simulations. And you might look at it and say, ooh, boring. Much more happens here, right? That's true. But the other way to phrase it, of course, would be more euphemistically, we have super high time resolution now. But, and actually, it may look boring, but you can extract a lot from it. For example, if you look at how much on these 100 nanosecond time scales, the motions of interest, like the motion of the tRNA or the L1 or the rotation motion, how much they fluctuate on this time scale, then you can learn something about the barriers separating these states, shown here. So here are three examples of those motions, the three color-coded ones here. Um, this is this motion I have, you have seen in the movies, and the bars, they don't indicate errors in this case, they indicate the size of the fluctuations, which means, for example, here, those fluctuations overlap of that state and of that state, which again means that the states can interconvert quickly on a time scale of 100 nanoseconds. On the other hand, that state and that state, for example, they don't overlap at all. Why? Because there must be a large barrier in between such that this state never jumps to this within 100 nanoseconds. It takes much longer. Actually, here we do see transitions in the simulations. Here we don't. So that gives us qualitative information on the barriers. Can we go a little more quantitative? And yes, we can do that. Um, by recalling what Rudy Marcus did when, before he got the Nobel Prize for electron transfer reactions. So he just said, oh, why don't we s just gather the statistics here? And you probably all know that if you have a density of states like here, that's now a, a histogram of these fluctuations for two states, uh, and you take the logarithm of it times kt and a minus sign, then you get a free energy. And because those are pretty close to a Gaussian, uh, the log of it is pretty close to a parabola, harmonic function. And that is exactly the same formalism which Rudy Marcus also used. Calculates the intersection of the two and you get an estimate for the barrier height. And that's what we kind of, we pulled off the same trick in a different field now and actually also got estimates for barrier heights and hence transition rates. And that is summarized in, in that plot here, which is a bit complicated, but don't focus on the detail. Just focus on the fact that there, there are a few very fast transitions, these are thick lines, and a few very slow transitions, thin lines or no line at all. And I would like to point your eyes to, to the fact that for the rotation motion, which I mentioned before, this huge conformational motions, there are thick or medium thick lines all over the place, which means they are fast. And the high barriers actually are there. So there you, you see such a high barrier that we can't reliably estimate the, the transition rate, but it must be slower than milliseconds. And so we propose that those are the rate limiting step. And what are they? Those are the motions of the tRNAs from one binding site to the next. It's not the largest motion, but it's the motion which suffers from the, the last, largest inherent barriers. And uh, that, by the way, suggested that if we do a, a, a sequence analysis, that should actually se reflect that evolution has worked hardest to keep the barriers low because it's a rate limiting step. And so you would predict a high level of sequence conservation, particularly for those interactions which we see here. And that's exactly what we found afterwards. And so that also was a prediction which turned out to be quite correct. Next question, what's the driving agent? L1 um, or uh, the green tRNA? Um, in order to address that, one way to address it, you have learned how to calculate free energies to calculate the interaction free energy between the two for different distances. And if you just keep this simple picture in mind here, imagine the interaction between the two, highly nonlinear, very complex, but just imagine it's a simple spring. If the green tRNA would be the driving agent pushing the L1 stock along, you would compress the spring. On the other hand, if the L1 would be the driving agent, you would expand the spring because it has to drag the tRNA along. And so you only have to look at the kind of minimum of free energy which corresponds to uh, the equilibrium distance and how, uh, whether it goes towards uh, the extended or the compressed form. This would be the compressed form upwards here and upwards here would be the extended. Clearly everything is on the extended side, so establishing that this is correct and this is wrong 
we actually thereby prove that the L1 stock is the active agent. And we now work our way through the ribosome to actually follow up all the cause and effect chains in the ribosome. One final note on that picture, I was also raising the question, is that actually a movie? And those timescales which we get for the intrinsic barrier rates, uh, barrier transition rates, also enables us to answer that question, whether this is really a time sequence or not. And the way to address that is to calculate the overall flux from all those rates for all possible permutations of those states here. So you mix them along in all possible ways, and for each of the possible sequences, you calculate an overall flux. And obviously, the one which gives the largest overall flux is the dominant kinetic pathway. And it turns out it's exactly that. So from now on, we know that what I have shown you before is actually a movie. In a stochastic way, of course, it's all about stochastics, but the largest flux is generated by this precisely this sequence of states, which is nice. One final uh, word about uh, the ribosome, and this is now the collaboration which we had with Daniel Wilson mo mostly. He had a wonderful cryo-M structure with an antibiotics in the exit tunnel, and that's shown here in red. The ribosome is turned a little around, so you may want to turn your heads also a bit. The exit tunnel now goes downwards, and that's the red stuff is, is the antibiotics, erythromycin, which is on the market. You probably have the, ingested it at, at some time against some flu or something. Um, what people thought is that the mode of action of this antibiotics is pretty simple. Um, it's a molecule which blocks the exit tunnel like a cork in a bottle. The nascent protein cannot leave the exit tunnel anymore. End of the story. Um, not so fast as Daniel Wilson has shown with this nice structure because you can see that the sequence of the nascent peptide in green here already passes by the erythromycin. So it doesn't block the tunnel completely. And actually, we know of sequences which can actually be synthesized despite the presence of the erythromycin. So that, of course, poses the question, how does it work then if it doesn't simply block the tunnel? What's the mode of action of this antibiotics? And to that end, we again carried out molecular dynamic simulation. No time to go too much into detail of those simulations. Just to mention, we compared the dynamics of this nascent chain here in the presence of the erythromycin with that in the absence. And we also looked at the tunnel walls, how they behave. And those, by the way, those amino acids are known targets for escape mutations. So if you mutate those to alanine, you get translation. If you keep that lysine, for example, you don't get translation. Nobody knows at that time why. And that was also one thing we wanted to find out here. And uh, one thing which struck us was that if we look um, at this side of the tunnel wall here, then we see structural changes as a reaction of the binding to the, of the erythromycin to, to the exit tunnel. So in particular, if we focus on, on this region here, the backbone um, of, the, uh, of the RNA, then you can see this conformational change. In red, in the presence of erythromycin, in green, in the absence. This is quantified from the simulation in terms of distances here. And now, you know the backbone of, uh, mass of RNA is, of course, these phosphates negatively charged here, whereas the lysine is positively charged. So you can understand that if you retract due to the binding of the erythromycin, this backbone here, then the lysine is kind of dragged along by Coulomb interaction. And if the lysine is dragged along, that increases the distance between the uh, tRNA whether amino acid is, is ready to be synthesized to the growing nascent chain on this side by a nucleophilic attack. The distance gets too large, the stereochemistry gets perturbed, and the synthesis step cannot take place anymore. And that's the new picture which emerged from our simulations, that actually it is not downside here in the tunnel where the problem is. The problem is up at the synthesis step via a quite a long-range allosteric interaction induced by the binding of the erythromycin. And that's what we learned from, from these simulations. And I think that's pretty important to understand how antibiotics work, because that may, at some point, perhaps trigger ideas how to improve antibiotics. All right, ah, yeah, there was one prediction which comes from these simulations. If it's as simple as just a Coulomb interaction between a negatively charged backbone and a positively charged amino acid, 
Of course, it was straightforward to suggest, well, if it works with lysine, it should also work with arginine, which is also positively charged. So we suggested to our friends who did the experiments, why don't you try whether an arginine mutant gets also stalled by the erythromycin? And strangely enough, that has never been done before. People hadn't looked at it, so they tried that. And that's probably the, the first and only uh, plot, uh, Western plot, which I show in, in my talk here. But you can see nicely that the uh, stalling ratio compared to uh, lysine is even higher. So uh, arginine stalls much stronger even than lysine. And uh, alanine doesn't stall at all. So another prediction just to test whether we are on the right track and worked out pr pretty well. Now I'd like to share a story with you, switching gears a bit, um, where our simulations did not work so well. I think it's important to also look at those. And that uh, occurred to us when we entered the field of disordered, intrinsically disordered proteins. So you know that most of the proteins we know of, at least those in the PDB, uh, have a certain three-dimensional structures, but a large fraction actually, uh, about a third of the proteins um, actually uh, do not have a native structure. They fluctuate from between many different structures and they are called intrinsically disordered proteins, yet they have a function, they work, they perform important tasks in your body. How is very often not known. And that raised our interest uh, together with many others to, to go into that field. And, and again, that, that's a, a message I really wanted to convey, please just don't believe because it's a simulation. So to make clear the difference, that's a folded protein, uh, I think it's BPTI, and that would be a typical disordered protein. So I guess the, you get the message immediately, there's a, a large difference between those two. Um, now, what brought us actually into the field is uh, we wanted to study the nuclear pore complex, and inside the nuclear complex, there's a huge meshwork of disordered proteins, so-called FG domains. And it is this nest matchwork which conveys selectivity against almost every larger object, proteins, ribosome parts, and so, except if they are attached to a karyoferrin protein, a carrier protein, if they are attached to importines or exportines, then they can go through. And we wanted to understand the selectivity process. So that's why we wanted to understand, uh, in the first place, this sort of proteins. And we are not yet there, uh, so don't expect an, an answer to that question um, for reasons which should become apparent in a minute. So careful as uh, Sarah Rauscher, who, who started that project, actually was, we did the same simulation of a test small peptide or protein, a disordered protein, with two different force fields, like this amber variant here, the, at that time the most recent one from the Shaw group, and uh, quite an old charm 22 star. And looked at the movies and that didn't look good. I mean, after all, it's the same protein. It really doesn't look the same, right? Uh, too bad. Um, quantifying that a bit more, we, we thought, aha, let's do a little bit more systematic study and try to really go through all the common force fields, actually including also one intrinsic ones, but all the others are uh, uh, implicit solvent one, all the others are explicit solvent. And uh, so we carried out long simulations of a few small proteins with all those force fields, and that, that is the result. And I think that came as a shock, not only to us, but I think to the field. So these are the different, question? No. Uh, these are the different force fields, and this is the distribution of radii of gyration of our simulations. And notice we have also error bars on those plots. So this is the shaded region here, but they are so small that there's no escape to shift the problem to uh, insufficient sampling. So we do have a millisecond of sampling in total. It's definitely not a sampling problem. All these things are converged pretty nice to within this error. And you can see, um, you can go by a factor of two just by switching the force field in the radius of gyration, average radius of gyration, just by change of force field. So we had a running gag in our lab which says, um, the, the IDPs are more affected by change of force field than by change of sequence. That cannot be. That's not, and at that time already, a couple of hundred papers had been published on some IDP simulations. So what can we do about it? Uh, obviously, that shows the limitations of our current force fields. All of those force fields do pretty well for, force, uh, for folded proteins, 
But as soon as you go to intrinsically disordered proteins, they are so sensitive, we think mostly to the water-protein interaction. It's all a, a, a kind of a, a tug of war between uh, water-protein interaction and entropy. And it's a very tiny differences in the uh, protein-water interactions which have a large effect on the radius of gyration and on the overall structure and dynamics of IDPs. So IDPs are super sensitive compared to, to folded proteins. And that's, I think, why we, we suffer from those problems. You can see ensembles superimposed many structures, uh, also quite clearly harsh differences between them. So we thought we don't want to develop a new force field, uh, but we probably at least want to find out which of those force fields comes close to experiment. And so we, we set up, together with McCarroll, uh, a larger effort to involve many experimental groups to give us as many, much as possible experimental data on as many as possible proteins and try to compare that. Uh, for example, radius of generation also measured uh, spectroscopically by the hydrodynamic radius. Uh, you can see already here that, for example, uh, here some of the force fields, like the yellow one, C22 star, comes pretty close to the experimental value, which is also true if you measure by NMR. Um, that's the experiment here. And, and others deviate quite a bit. And, and we carried that out for a number of experiments, like small angle scattering. Again, you see nice agreement in some cases. Here, the umber force field, and again, our, our friend 22 star. And you see larger deviations, like here. The gray is the experiment, the, the blue is the simulation. Um, NMR data, chemical shifts, etc. we went through. Same story. Some of them agree nicely, others don't, um, and so on. The whole thing is summarized here in this table. Green is good, bad is red, and if you go through them, you'll find that there's one of them, it's 22 star actually, which agrees pretty nice with all experiments we could get a hand of, and uh, that would suggest that 22 star is pretty good. Which raised one question, which we were quite puzzled. Um, of course, you know, Charm 36, which is supposed to be, these are two different water models, um, which are, is supposed to be better, an improvement to 22 star. But the data spoke against it. So there is many red dots here. So why is 36 not better? And we looked a bit deeper into that, and it turned out that actually there was a, actually several simple bugs, if you want, in, in that force field. Uh, which had to do with the van der Waals radius and with the hero angle, specifically in the backbone, which created artificially left-handed helices to an extent which is not compatible with the PDB. Too much left-handed helix in, in the Charm 36. And, and so we cured that, again collaborating with Andrew McC with McCarroll, and modified it, uh, and this is now published as Charm 36M. And if you do then the comparison to experiment, it fits perfectly well, so I think it's a good idea now to use either Charm 22 star, or if you want a more recent force field, 22, uh, 26, 36M, uh, which we published recently, and which at least uh, gets something right for the disordered proteins. Please still don't believe it. We have examples also for larger, particularly for larger like disordered proteins like synuclein, where umber seems to perform better. So I'm pretty sure that's not the end of the story. I'm pretty sure pretty hard work is needed to further improve the force fields to really get intrinsically disordered proteins right. And it may even be that we are here at a point where we need to switch to polarizable force field to really get it accurate. I don't know whether we need or not, uh, but that might be a point where we would have to, and future will show what, what will happen. All right. So I'm how am I doing in time? Ah, okay. I think it might be a good idea to skip the, the dinosome and just to leave us a bit time uh, for the riddle which I promised. And uh, that's the following. Uh, it's pretty simple. It, and that's work which I did with Herman Behrens, in fact. And I, I really recall uh, with very good memory the discussions we had on, on that one. Um, imagine you have a simple system two molecules. For example, the trigger was actually a simulation, two helices in a membrane. The helices diffuse, and sometimes they bind in the simulation box, and sometimes they unbind. And the idea was from the ratio of times unbound and bound to get a free energy of binding, 
of these two helices. Very simple. And actually, when I was editing for the Biophysical Journal, I got a paper which did that, tried that on my desk, and I sent it out for a referee. It was uh, valued quite nicely, so everything looked quite nicely. And then I looked at that formula here. So the authors did the following. They said, OK, in order to get the free energy of binding, we need to get the equilibrium binding constant, obviously. Um, and we all know, as chemists, we know the law of mass action, like that. So the concentration of the products divided by the product of the concentration of the educts gives us this equilibrium constant. We all know that. In this case, it's pretty simple because whenever A is unbound from B, obviously, because we have only one or two molecules, obviously then B is also unbound from A, so we can replace this by A square. And we can, of course, replace the concentrations by frequencies, by probabilities. In other words, that would be the time, the fraction of time we find the system, number of snapshots if you want, we find the system in the bound state, and that would be the number of snapshots uh, where we find the system in the separated state. Easy enough, we can get that from isolation, and that's what the authors did. Plugged that in into the logarithm and got a free energy. And I looked at it and say, wait a minute. These are times in the first place. Um, nanoseconds. So this ratio is one over nanosecond. And you should probably better not put a dimension into the logarithm. That was actually with something which caught my attention. But then I reassured myself and said, oh, well, but you can, of course, divide each of that into a, a divided by the total simulation time, so you get a dimensionless probability, and then things are fine. But then I thought a little further, and being a physicist, I, I thought about how would I do it? And I thought about the Boltzmann relation. And the Boltzmann relation would tell you, aha, we have two states, two thermodynamic states. And one is together, one is separated. And we all know that according to the Boltzmann relation, um, the ratio between these two states is given by the delta G between the two states, which if you invert it, gives you this simple formula. So we were talking about how to do free energy calculations. Uh, that would be a pretty simple one. No Zwanzig formula, no thermodynamic integration or perturbation, no uh, Chasinski, nothing. Just counting how often is the system there, how often is it there. The ratio gives you a delta G. That's, I thought, how I would do it. And then I noticed, oops, hmm, that's different. So obviously, one of it must be wrong, maybe both. That's always possible. Don't forget this option. Uh, but at least one of it must be wrong because it simply gives different results. And that's now the riddle for you. Find out which is wrong. That's the chemists, mass of law action. That's the physicists, Boltzmann relation. Which is true, which is not. And if you are really good, find out why. What's wrong with one of the two? Why does it go wrong? Because, I mean, both equations are textbook equations, and you know pr them pretty well. They are fairly well established. And that is kind of a surprise. And I also couldn't find out immediately what's going on there. And uh, having the privilege of being an editor of that paper, I thought, ha, I got some nice colleagues, referees, who can help me out. And I sent out the paper to eight colleagues, asking each of them, don't look at the whole paper, just answer to me the question, which of the two is correct? Did the authors do that correctly? And I got back eight replies, very quickly, nice colleagues, thanks all, to all of them. Four of them said the first equation is wrong, four of them the second. That didn't help me too much, and so I sat down together with Lars Schäfer, in fact, in my group and started trying to think about it a bit more deeply. And that's also where Hermann Berenson got involved. And as a result, we published, I think, a nice paper, which I hope resolves the issue. So if you want to destroy the fun of it, read the paper, but try to think about yourself and find out and then compare later about uh, with this paper. I think it's a nice exercise. And it also tells you nicely how to uh, calculate free energies. And uh, with that, I'd like to close. I think it's a, a really nice uh, closure of a, a session which I really want to dedicate to Hermann Berenson, uh, who did uh, probably more to the field than anyone else I know. And I thank you for your attention.
So, Helmut, thank you very much for the crystal clear, the uh, really inspiring uh, lecture that I think stimulate many, many young students to raise their hands and start with the discussion time. So, please. Time to wake up now. Yeah, we, we, do, we need some action. We, yes. Come on, I have a, many questions for Helmut, but I, I want to leave you the, the, the chance to do that. It's an unmissable opportunity. Come on, guys. Any? Oh, okay. Okay, first of all, really nice talk. Thank you for this. And I have a question regarding the uh, IDPs. So the simulations were done only on one structure? I mean, on only one IDP? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we had a total of, I think, 16 different IDPs at the end of the day and 10 folded proteins, also to check whether uh, our modification to 32, CHARM36 uh, actually also reproduces the folded protein data. So it's mostly uh, smaller IDPs, the largest one I think like 50 amino acids, um, but quite many of them, 16 or so. Of and for all of them, the, the same forsuit was the best? For all of them, the same trend. But I should again maybe re-emphasize re a, a note of caution. Those are all relatively small uh, IDPs simply because of convergence issues. The others we don't get converged. Um, it may well be that things change for larger ones and we have indications for that. It may well be that other force fields like amber uh, are better for larger force field, uh, for larger IDPs. I don't know yet. But for smaller ones, I think 36 is, uh, 36M is a good choice. Thank you. Another question? Guys? Who votes for the law of mass action? Come who, on. Who votes for Boltzmann? Come on. <laughs> who does abstain? All of them. Okay. Well, you, you, you touch so many. Uh, you want to say case anything? It's fine. Okay. Um, you touch so many, so many points, really interesting. Uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, very, very important uh, still today is for our simulations. So I have so many questions, but I would like to uh, uh, stay on two points, so two, two slides, or two topics that you cover, because uh, I'm really interested also uh, um, in the perspective of their, 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 or the students or their uh, preparation. Um, in the paper where you, uh, uh, the science paper you show about atomic force microscopy and the, 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 the steering molecular dynamics you show the difference between the curve that you obtain from MD simulations and the others for the experiments. Uh, I may say, I'm correct on, or not if I say that the difference of the inclination of the line that you show in the, in the force is, uh, is, uh, is a relation, of course, of the dissipative work that you have. Yes. Yeah, it, it's a measure. If you want to quantify, uh, it's, it's uh, correct, right? Yeah. Just to let also to understand better this point. Right. So maybe I go back to, to that slide first. Right. That's the one you mentioned. Isn't it a surprise that you get it published in science with your, okay. <laughs> um, so yes, so this upslope is friction. And what we did is we said, okay, uh, we don't know the friction coefficient and we don't know the slope here. So let's put a function, this logarithmic behavior plus a linear behavior with a friction coefficient that gives us two fitting parameters and we fitted this function to that, and that fitted pretty well. I didn't show that here. Um, assuming that you just can add up friction and, and activated processes. And that's, of course, an assumption, and that's a relatively weak assumption. Um, but that described the whole range pretty well and also makes sense in terms of, of Stokes friction. Uh, that's what we could do at that time. Uh, today, when the situation looks like that, you can go further. And I think it's not exactly um, true to say that this uprise is exactly only due to friction. Friction contributes, but if you look at the numbers, friction sets in about here upwards. So that was our previous paper, more or less, right? So also, so this uprise has a different reason. And the reason being is, I didn't explain that, uh, that we have a more complex energy landscape, which is shown here. It has two barriers. Now, now I have to explain uh, where the slope comes in the first place. So you noticed, uh, uh, you remember this plots here, and you can imagine if you make this distance between the minimum and the maximum smaller, then the shrinkage of the barrier, the, the, the speed by which it gets lower, 
with the uprising force here is slower, simply because the force doesn't have so much distance to act on, right? So if you tilt it, it doesn't affect the barrier so much. And that is the smaller you make the distance between here and here, which means that actually how fast these things wrap up here tells you about the distance between the minimum and the maximum. That's the so-called rupture length. Now, that is this slope here, which indicates a relatively, it's one over the length. It indicates a large distance, like between here and here. But you can imagine now, if you tilt the whole thing, there is a point where this barrier becomes dominant, and this barrier just vanishes behind the barrier. And then you have a, suddenly a smaller rupture length, and one over rupture length, a stronger slope, higher slope. And that is the main reason why we see this continuous upbending. And actually, I haven't told you that, but this dashed line here is the result of one-dimensional Smolokovsky diffusion simulations, which we carried out with exactly this energy landscape. And we used a fit of, the, of this landscape to the whole data in order to get this la energy landscape. It's just four parameters or so, which we extract now from the whole curve, which is possible because we have 13 order of magnitudes if we combine experiment and, and simulation. And thanks for the trigger here. I should also re-emphasize that is a nice example where you can definitely learn more if you do not only do simulations, if you do not only do mathematics, and if you don't only do experiments, but if you combine the three of them. And then you get most out of it. And I guess that's one maybe rule you want to follow in your scientific career. Try to combine everything you know. And, and that gives the best. Don't focus dogmatically on one. Thank you, Al. But you got exactly, exactly the point. Because the message for the students is that when you do, OK, thermodynamics dynamics is simple. Just pull it, put the force, and then see the results. But you should understand better what is going on. That's, wh that's why also Al was very accurate in uh, showing you uh, that uh, the simulative work and changing the, the parameters, the force, the pulling force is important, not to get just the results, but to understand also to compute the forward and backward also uh, re um, reaction in order to be sure that what you're doing is precise and accurate. So, and, and you can compare with experiments pretty, uh, in, a, in a fair way. The last, if there are questions for you guys, so I stimulate Helmut you know, uh, with the, the last uh, remark that he, he raised that it, I, of course it's, I'm very interested in because we work a lot on binding free energy and leak and protein binding interaction. So the missing piece, the missing player of, of that uh, equation could be the standard concentration. Oh yeah, that thanks. That uh, in many cases plays a role. So uh, can you comment a little bit on that? Because when you compare the two equations, um, the dimensionality, because also we, I, I pay the attention to the fact that the, the, the argument of the logarithm should be a dimensional. So the standard equation solved the, the fact that the Are you are referring to my last riddle? Yeah, 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 yeah. sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. the last point. Yeah. So the argument of the logarithm should be a dimensional. Yes. And so the standard concentration, uh, in that sense, could be a player to, 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 to find a solution between the comparison of the two. Could yeah. you please uh, comment a little bit on that, or, or what do you think about yeah. that? Yeah, it could be. I think it's not the main player, but um, yeah, you can formulate the, the solution to the riddle in a way that it, you can kind of push the blame to the standard concentration. You can do that. Um, but if you define the concentration here in a straightforward way, um, like uh, just how many molecules, two, you have in, in your unit volume, that gives you a concentration. And if you work with that, it should go OK. Mass of law action tells you it should go OK. Um, so it, it, it don't tell the students more. They, they should think about okay, themselves. Okay. It's uh, but a, it, it's, it's my view is that it's, it's an important uh, point. It's, it's the entropy that is missing. That, that was. But anyway, yeah. uh, we let, let think, let, let, let let's let, let them work on it. Let's yeah. simulate their the brain. Yeah. So, and the very, very last, if I can, other question, because I have so many questions, but, but I can also discuss with him personally later on. Later on. No? So, last one. Sorry, but I'm so curious <laughs> about, uh, no, because I really enjoyed your lecture, actually. And I saw the, the subtle differences that you show about the RGNA plus and mm -hmm. TRNA. So of course, since you have also uh, clearly show how force fields are important in simulations, how sensitive are these subtle and very accurate uh, results to the force field that you use in the, in this, the, yes. the study? Yes, for ribosome, we have mostly used amber force fields <laughs> for this very simple reason. There is not too much, too many force fields around. Uh, where, where you can simulate DNA, or RNA, and proteins in the same place. Um, so we didn't have the chance to really try systematically many different force fields. Um, and that is also why we are really insisting in doing these comparisons to experiments and, and to see whether we can make correct predictions, etc. So in that particular case, because that prediction turned out to be true, 
we tend to believe what we see here. Um, and in terms of, by the way, in terms of uh, minute differences, it might be interesting for you to learn that this antibiotics binds to the bacterial ribosome and not, hopefully, luckily, to the human ribosome. That would be bad, right? You don't want that. Um, and the reason why it does so is just the exchange of one nucleotide at the position where, where the ribosome, uh, where the erythromycin binds. And the effect is that you have one H bond more in the bacterial ribosome compared to the human ribosome. So next time you swallow an antibiotics, think about it. It's one H bond which makes the difference between death and life, both for the bacteria and for you. Okay, now, uh, very last promise uh, question, a follow up to this question. Uh, I would like to have your opinion also uh, to inspire students for the future about the force field. Uh, development. You mentioned about polarization, I agree, but one thing that, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's a limiting factor that we treat the residues as the same in all the protein structure, independently of the neighboring atoms, neighboring residues, and the position in the uh, secondary structure of all the. So, is, uh, do you think that it's time and we can exploit the computing power, also machine learning algorithms, in order to have a system dependent force field for each system we are going to study to optimize torsion, uh, charge, of course polarization effect, so to have a specific forcing for each specific residues for in each specific system. Thank yeah. you. Could you please give me your opinion on that? Yes, I can only guess because I don't know. Um, but I, I, I think it would be wonderful to have that. If you ask my guts feeling, I would think the lack of explicit polarization is more important than the lack of a description of the differences between, of the interactions in different residues. That would be my, my personal guts feeling. But again, it's a guts feeling. I really don't know. So if I had a lot of money and a lot of people and would like to go into force field development, I would probably put my money into polarizable force fields, as a number of people do already. I, I mentioned Michael Levitt already. He's working very hard on, on new force fields. And since very recently, people come up with machining learning force fields, which I think is a very exciting development. And but the main limitation, what we might ask, why don't we have faster progress in, in that? The main limitation is lack of experimental data. Um, we have already quite a number of parameters which we need to fit against experimental data for the non-polarizable force fields. And there is even much more, many more parameters to fix for polarizable force fields, of course. And the lack of experimental data is, is very much hampering also inconsistent experimental uh, and, and so on. It's very much hampering progress there. Not so much computer power. And then you might, of course, say, OK, why don't you use quantum mechanics to calibrate the force field? Of course, we all know it has been done. OPLS is an example. And of course, that is a way to go. But again, uh, maybe contrary to widespread belief, our quantum mechanics methods are not that super accurate. Very often, force fields which were calibrated against experiment give, for example, more accurate free energies than those calibrated against quantum mechanics. Reason being that they are calibrated against free energy. It's not an art. But uh, still, uh, it tells you that there's a lot of work to be done also on the side of quantum mechanics. And just the off-the-shelf density functional theory won't do it. And others are probably too expensive, F full FTF or something. That's simply too expensive. So that's the other barrier we run against. And, uh, Breaking one of each would be very nice. Uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, let's see. So, let's so say thank you again to Elmo for the brilliant lecture. Thanks. And let's wait for the experimental session. Now it's time for coffee break, and we'll come with Luca after coffee break. <laughs>
break, and this is the last uh, teacher of this morning lecture, uh, morning session. Uh, it's uh, a big pleasure for me uh, to introduce you, uh, Luca Monticelli, comes from CNRS and University of Lyon, France. And let's do some cos grain now. So this one and the talk tomorrow is about that. So let thank you, Luca, for accepting our our invitation, and the stage is yours. Thank you. <coughs> and thanks to all the organizers for organizing this beautiful school. I'm really uh, honored to be here. So as Helmut, I would also like to start with uh, two words on Hermann Berenson, who passed away on, uh, last Monday. Um, and I can only join uh, with, with the same, same thoughts as, as, as Helmut. Uh, my personal memory of Hermann was uh, uh, extraordinarily sharp uh, thinker, but especially uh, the reason why it's been, uh, at least for myself, uh, a role model was his, his incredible humbleness and generosity. And that was, uh, that was really remarkable. So, objectives of my talk today. Um, I would like, first of all, to introduce some general concepts on coarse graining so that we have a common vocabulary, we understand each other. If you don't understand something, uh, you should interrupt me. It is no problem if you interrupt. Um, and then I would like to go a little bit more in depth for one particular coarse grain model, which is called the Martini coarse grain <coughs> force field. And that's a completely arbitrary choice. There's very many coarse grain force fields, of course, and this is a my choice to speak about this one. Actually, I was asked to speak about this one as I've been one of the developers of this one. Um, then, at this point, I will probably make a five minutes break and restart with applications. This part, instead, will be relatively shallow, and, and the, the objective really is to show you a uh, palette of different uh, problems that you can tackle with the Martini force field. Um, and finally, I would like to conclude with limitations uh, for the Martini force field. Okay, so let's get started. Ah, actually, no. Uh, a few words also on the tutorial for today, for, for the afternoon. Uh, there will be one, possibly two tutorials, so that you manage to put theory into action. Uh, you will uh, do yourself, perform your yourself some really simple self-assembly simulations with, with, with lipids, and possibly, if there is time, something on proteins as well. All right, so since the focus of this school is mostly on biosystems, I thought I would start with uh, showing you something about the size of typical systems we're interested in. And they span a, a wide range of sizes, but uh, things get interesting probably at this level with viruses, bacteria, organelles, and even more interesting with entire cells. Now, these objects are extremely large, like extremely, extremely large, like actually already at this point, we are well over one billion atoms. So that's, uh, of course, uh, scary and problematic for the cost. Eh? On the other hand, if you know something about software and hardware, uh, you also know that uh, most modern MD codes scale almost linearly uh, with size. Eh? So it's only the long range electrostatics uh, scales as n log n, the rest is actually linear. Um, and that also means if you want to simulate something big in principle, you should just use a bigger computer, right? And, and that's, that's true to some extent, but there's an additional problem. It's not only a matter of length scales, but there's a time scale problem. Typically, motions with a large amplitude involving very many atoms are also extremely slow. They are much slower. Eh? Um, uh, so a bigger computer is not uh, necessarily enough. Um, also, as you can easily distribute atoms over different processors. So as, as you get more atoms, bigger system, you, you just have more processors and you, you can do the calculation. The problem is that you can't distribute time over processors. Eh? You, you, uh, 
this is the, the basic scheme for, for molecular dynamics, which you probably have seen in other talks. Eh? You always start with positions, you get energies, forces, acceleration, and then you have some kind of equation of motion. And in order to get the position at some time t plus delta t, you always need the position at time t. So you just can't parallelize. This is intrinsically difficult to parallelize. Eh? Um, so one of the solutions that uh, people have devised over the past uh, decades is being coarse graining. And now this is like my very pictorial view of coarse graining. This is an all atom model of a very common lipid. I think this is DOPC probably. <coughs> it's around 150 atoms. Uh, the, the, the white ones would be the hydrogens. I don't know, this is a coarse grain model. We typically call it a united atom model because the hydrogens have been incorporated into the, the, the adjacent carbon. And this is already, it's a reduction by a factor of three in the number of atoms, about 50 atoms. Now this is a more typical coarse grain model in which several heavy atoms have been grouped together into uh, these effective interaction sites. And then this is like a very, very coarse grained. And of course, you, you, you can guess immediately that going left to right, the accuracy of your uh, system d decreases. Eh? So, so the spontaneous question is, is wh why would you do that? I mean, you know that you're being less and less accurate, of course. And actually, so this is like, a, I, I, managed, I didn't manage to find quite the same movie as, as Helmut, but, but I wanted to show something just <laughs> along the same lines, you know. Uh, uh, again, real, uh, real, real life phenomenon, so the flight of an eagle. Let's say you want to understand this real life phenomenon, right? an eagle flying, and uh, this would be the coarse grained version of it. And you see, so, so it's got, the, the bird has got no feathers, uh, the color is wrong, it's got no eyes, also. All, all sorts of details are wrong, but this flies. Okay, so bottom line. This actually can reproduce some dynamics, uh, and, then, and then up to you if, uh, if this is sufficient or not for your specific problem. Now, a little bit more formally. Of course, the main reason for coarse graining is efficiency. Right? Uh, with coarse graining, you can study bigger systems on much longer time scales, obviously. But then, as my friend Marcus Deserno always says, there's a second reason for coarse graining, which is insight. As you take out details from the description of the system, if you can still reproduce the phenomenon of interest, it means that those details that you've taken out were not important, obviously. Okay? And the moment you take out some detail and then the phenomenon is not reproduced anymore, then you learn that that detail was the important one that you should not have taken out. So, so obviously, the, some of these models, I mean, these models are obviously toys, eh? and you can use them as toys, because you can do completely unphysical things, and from those unphysical manipulations, you can learn what details, which detail is important to, to reproduce each phenomenon. Eh? So this, I think this is a very important uh, part. Uh, now, some general ideas on coarse graining. <coughs> By the way, I apologize for my voice, but this is a the effect of yesterday night, uh, <laughs> very loud uh, restaurant. Mm. <sighs> okay, I would say there's two main families of coarse-grained methods. The first one is what typically we call uh, structure-based or systematic models. Some people call them bottom-up models. Uh, I find I, I get I'll always get confused what's bottom and what's up. Uh, so I, I prefer actually systematic or structure-based. So these models actually are actually optimized to reproduce some kind of structural property of the system. I'm not going to focus very much on this today because we are lucky enough to have Greg Both tomorrow uh, who will speak extensively, uh, I guess, about, about this type of uh, approach. Um, I will focus more on thermodynamics-based models. These are obviously empirical because they hey, you, you're using empirical, like experimental data uh, in the parameterization of the model. Um, they're sometimes called top-down. Uh, um, so these models are optimized to reproduce thermodynamic properties of systems, and those thermodynamic properties are, uh, come from experiments, typically. This is just a quick example to show how uh, things are done in some cases. 
uh, you see an all atom simulation of just a box of water actually. Uh, from this you can easily calculate what we call a radial distribution function. That's a measure of the probability of finding a particle at a certain distance from uh, uh, another given particle. And these, uh, these RDFs, radial distribution functions, look typically like this. And you can always devise a model uh, with as many particles as you like with potentials which would reproduce uh, the RDF. Now, this, you, you might not be able to see it, but there's actually three curves overlapped. One is from atomistic simulations and the others are from coarse grain simulations. Obviously, these models uh, do an excellent job at reproducing the structure of liquid water. Right? This is work by the Kramer group a few years back. Now, with um, uh, more complex fluids, uh, this job is not so easy. In fact, it's a typical reverse pro or inverse problem, um, uh, which I would explain with an example like this. If I give you uh, uh, ingredients and a recipe, most of you will be able to bake some cake. But then if I give you the cake, it will be much more difficult for you to guess the ingredients and the recipe. And one typical way to do this is like you, you, you give it a try, you, you, make a, you make a guess, you produce something, then you compare this with the original, and then, and then you iterate. So you repeat until the result looks more or less like the original. And this is, this is what happens with coarse graining very often. In fact, it's not only structure-based coarse graining. This also happens uh, often with, with, with empirical uh, models or thermodynamics-based models. Uh, anyways, there's, a, in principle, a very clear difference between the two approaches. As, as I said, uh, the target for thermodynamics-based uh, cause graining is experimental data, and you, and you pick the experimental data that you prefer. It could be density, it could be for water, for example, dipole moment, heat of vaporization, surface tension, whichever you like. Eh? You, you, you pick one and you reproduce that one, and then, <coughs> and then you try to develop a force field that is consistent uh, with the property you choose. Now, for example, uh, one of the force fields developed along those lines is the one by Shinoda, Klein, and Devane. The, some people call it SDK models, so Shinoda, Devane, Klein. Uh, that's based on density and interfacial tensions, so surface tension or uh, interfacial tension with water. And the model does an excellent job at reproducing these properties. Right? Uh, but today I'm going to focus, as I mentioned, on, on this Martini, coarse grain model, which is also thermodynamics based. And it looks more or less like this. Actually, before I continue, are there any questions so far? Everything's clear? More or less, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, or everything's obscure. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see later on. So Martini Force, first of all, just to avoid confusions on the name, uh, Martini is the name of this tower uh, in the central square in the city of Groningen, and that's the University of Groningen, where this guy works. And this is Siever Jan Merink. He's the main developer of the force field. He's the one who got the idea in the first place. And then the developer groups, uh, well, the, actually, the, the, there are several developers, but okay, the core development is still done at the University of Groningen. Um, and the model looks more or less like this. Um, you see here the black uh, balls and sticks are um, the heavy atoms of a typical lipid, it's DPPC. And then the green transparent spheres are the coarse grain beads. Uh, the mapping is one to four for most molecules, except for ring molecules. Here is one to two. This way we can have ring molecules that are actually rings. The center of the uh, uh, coarse grain site is in the center of mass of a group of atoms which you have to choose. So when you do the mapping, you choose a group of atoms. And then the center of mass will be the center of the center of the, the, the position of the coarse grain bead. Um, another important feature is that Martini is, um, uses a building block approach, which means that each bead is parameterized separately, and then you can stitch the beads together to make molecules uh, the way you like. In, in a way, it's like Lego, right? So you put pieces together to produce whichever molecule you like. Um, and this is a representation of Martini proteins. All uh, amino acids have uh, one bead for the backbone, and some amino acids have beads for the side chains too. Actually, most amino acids have beads for the side chains, except for 
alanine and glycine, where is glycine? Uh, I'll, here. Uh, yeah, those are, I mean, alanine has only a methyl group as a side chain, therefore uh, we decided not to uh, make any coarse brain bead for that. But the others do have uh, beads for the side chain. And the number of beads depends on the size, of course, of the amino acid, with tryptophan being the largest. And then the beads have different degrees of polarity, going from completely nonpolar, as you have, for, for example, in azoleucine or leucine, going to intermediate and then polar and even charged beads for those uh, four amino acids which are typically charged. Uh, uh, among the main features uh, that you're probably uh, that you probably want to know about Martini is that is a speed up. So the speed up is a factor between 200 and 1,000. So it's like two to three orders of magnitude, depending on the details of the system you're interested in. Uh, this is due mostly to uh, a reduction of number of degrees of freedom, uh, the fact that interactions are typically only short ranged, and then the very large time step that you can use is typically 10 times larger than atomistic simulations. Um, this model. I believe is very versatile as it provides consistent uh, models for very many bio macromolecules, uh, in fact also for non-bio macromolecules. Um, it's very easy to use, as I said, it uses a building block approach, uh, it uses physical units which you can immediately relate to, and it reproduces accurately the partitioning of molecules and all properties related to partitioning. Uh, now, since partition is, is, is so central, I would spend a few more words on it. I, th I think you all know what's a partitioning experiment, but just to make sure, I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, say you have two liquids, a blue liquid and a yellow liquid. Say the blue liquid is water, for example, and the yellow would be oil, for example, and they don't mix. Now, if you add a molecule uh, of interest, let's say the red molecule, you can uh, experimentally measure how many of the red molecules are found in the blue liquid, so let's say water, and how many in oil. Now the ratio uh, of this is the partition coefficient of your molecule, eh? so that's the average density of your molecule in oil over the average density of your molecule in water, which relates to the free energy of transfer uh, of the molecule in this very simple uh, way. And the interesting thing is this, these free energies of transfer have been measured experimentally uh, for tens of thousands of compounds, uh, starting from the beginning of the previous century. So there's an insane amount of data about this, uh, which makes it very convenient as a target property for parameterization. Uh, so th in this case, um, the, the uh, experimental data is absolutely not a problem for the parameterization. We have a lot of experimental data. Uh, this is some, some of the experimental data we have. So here you see on, on the left, uh, this is maybe difficult to read. I hope you can see something, but it's not important to, uh, uh, to, to, to see everything. So here on the, on the left column, we have different beat types uh, that are present in Martini. He, these are the corresponding uh, chemical moieties with their chemical names. And here are a bunch of uh, thermodynamic properties. For example, the last column would be the free energy of transfer uh, between water and octanol. We have experimental data and the result of a coarse grain simulation. Okay? So these things are um, easily calculated and easily measured. And all beads, each bead in Martini is parameterized in such a way that it actually reproduces the experimental data. Uh, regarding partitioning. Uh, okay. Um, and why partitioning? Why did we choose partitioning in the first place? Well, the thing is, partitioning is one of the main driving forces uh, for self assembly of biological macromolecules. Well, not only biological, in fact, but like more, I would say probably all soft matter. So, um, uh, it, for example, uh, amphiphies with two way seal chains and a head group, they self assemble as you know in the form of, in, in a lamellar uh, phase, like lipid bilayers for example, uh, under certain conditions they could also form inverse micelles or micelles, and this is simply due to partitioning, right? So there's, there's, a, there's always a head group that likes to partition into water and some um, acyl chain that likes to stay away from water, that's just simple partitioning. Also, partitioning determines the interaction of proteins, 
with membranes and also other macromolecules. Uh, this is an example, you see a beautiful all atom model of a protein that has uh, a red side which is hydrophobic and a blue side which is hydrophilic and a protein like that would most likely sit on, 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 a, on top of a membrane. Hmm? While if instead uh, the protein was mostly hydrophobic with only hydrophilic b uh, bits uh, at, at the termini, well, that probably would like to sit in a transmembrane orientation. Again, this is like just partitioning. This comes out of partitioning. So if you have a model that reproduces partitioning, you can reproduce these things. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that partitioning is one of the main driving forces uh, for protein folding and protein structure. And this was shown in a, in a very elegant way by Kendall in the 90s uh, with the HP model. Um, uh, not going into the details of this, but this is just to show you that in the HP model you only have two types of beads, the hydrophobic and polar, and uh, strings of beads with um, uh, only um, uh, hydrophobic and, and polar actually uh, fold into a very limited number of minimum energy uh, configurations, uh, exactly like real proteins. Now, unfortunately, uh, partition is not the only driving force uh, for protein folding. There's a number of other details which are extremely important, so a model that only contains information on partitioning will not be able to fold anything, and in fact, this Martini is a good example of that, because it's absolutely unable to fold the things uh, reasonably. But still, we have some ingredients uh, that are correct. Now, more into the details uh, of, the, of, of the Martini force field, we look at the functional form. Um, we have bonded interactions that actually look very much like in atomistic models, meaning you have a harmonic bond and harmonic angles, then you have Coulomb interactions, but only for ions. So you have no partial charges in Martini, you only have integer charges for, 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 uh, for ions. And then you have Lana-Jones uh, functions, uh, which are the standard 612 Lana-Jones. Eh? This is one of the reasons uh, that makes it so easy to use, because in fact, any code that is able to run an all atom simulation can also run a Martini simulation because the functional form is actually uh, about the same. Um, now, I probably, yeah, I guess I want to say this because I want to talk about limitations related to this at the end. In the first version of the force field, all beads had the same size and also the, the length of the bonds uh, was always the same. That's about half a nanometer. Later on, uh, Siebert found it convenient, we all found it convenient to have also S beads, so S stands for small, and T beads, T stands for tiny. Okay, so, <coughs> uh, these beads have smaller Leonard Jones sigma parameter, um, and the bond lengths are typically derived from atomistic simulations. Okay? So now you have a little bit of structure-based uh, coarse graining entering into Martini. This was already in version two. Uh, uh, one problem I, I, I'm anticipating is uh, the, the interactions with the regular beads uh, kept always the same sigma. We will see that this actually leads to some artifacts uh, in the end, but this is how it works for now until version two. Now, again, a little bit more in detail on the bonded interactions, and I, I do this because I want to give you a, a flavor of how we actually do things in, in practice, eh? since... <coughs> Apologize, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Ah. So like in uh, all atom models, it, well, uh, similarly, I would say, you also have uh, dihedrals, you have angles involving backbone, 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 but also backbone, backbone, side chain, and also backbone, side chain, side chain, for example. So all these sort of interactions are present. Um, and the functional form, as I mentioned, looks more or less like this. Actually, I think there's, a, I think there's an error here. I apologize. I think this should, this should be cosine theta minus cosine theta zero squared. But okay, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very similar, similar enough. Um, the way we proceed 
uh, is actually by having an initial guess uh, for, for these parameters, so the, the constants uh, here and here, or here and here, for example. And then we have some adjustments, and, and the guidelines for adjustments are always the same. It's like simplicity, because we're going to have simple uh, functions and stability. We want to be able to run simulations with a long time step and be numerically stable. I'll show you this type of detail, which is mm, well, typically never shown. It's, 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 it's boring, probably. But then you, you, you get a flavor of, of how we really worked on this. Uh, we, we took 2,000 structures at random from the PDB, then converted them into coarse grain structures, you know, by calculating the center of mass of different beads. And then we calculated uh, these pseudo bond distributions, right? And then tried to fit. Uh, but unfortunately, what you get is this. So you get something that is dependent on the secondary structure. Also, you get distributions which, are, which have multiple peaks in some cases. So, you're, so here, you're a little bit in, in trouble. You have to choose, you have to make a choice whether you really want to reproduce these type of things or, or not. Eh? And the choice for Martini was uh, to not reproduce it um, for the sake of speed and simplicity. So that's why it remains mostly thermodynamics based and not structure based. The structural de details are really not reproduced very carefully. Uh, in fact, we chose only one uh, distance for backbone backbone interactions or bonds. Um, and the force constants uh, were chosen to be all larger than, uh, well, in this case, I guess, it, I guess it was 400 in the beginning. Uh, 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 in order to reproduce more or less the width of the distributions. Now, some distributions were so narrow that actually to reproduce the width, we would have to use a very high force constant. Now, very high force constant, as you, as you probably know, means very fast vibrations. Fast vibration means you have to use a short time step. A short time step is bad because it makes your simulation slow. So when the, time, when, when the force constant was very high, we replaced it with a constraint so we could keep a long time step and make it faster. Uh, and the same thing we did for angles, and I'm not going into this detail. Uh, and we also have the hedrals. Now, the hedrals, you, you see from these distributions, this, this is uh, obviously problematic. Uh, I, I think it's quite obvious. Uh, for, for helices, uh, things are fine, because the typical dihedral, so one, two, three, four, that's around 60 degrees with a narrow distribution. You can easily put a dihedral here. Instead, for coil and extended structures, the distribution is extremely wide. Uh, and it turned out that the best solution is n not to use any dihedral at all for this. In fact, you keep secondary, actually, I have a slide on this. Yes, I do. Uh, uh, secondary structure in general in Martini is imposed and not predicted. Uh, it's imposed by dihedral in the case of helices and it's imposed through an elastic network in the case of beta sheets. Um, therefore, this rules out all applications to protein folding, for example. It's uh, obviously not uh, appropriate for this type of model. On the other hand, there's many other questions, many other types of applications that remain um, within, within the realm of possible things you can tackle with Martini. One of them being the interaction of proteins with other biological macromolecules, or including protein-protein interaction in principle, and then changes in the tertiary structure of proteins. These are also possible. And then, of course, there's also all, all, all the rest of, of, of the molecules uh, parametrizing Martini. You can always study the interactions uh, between these molecules. And I'm going to show you later some examples of this. Uh, actually, I'm showing you now some examples of this. Um, and this part will be probably uh, a little bit shallow, as I have very many examples. And then I don't go into any detail for any of them, but I have references for all of them. Uh, so you can. Uh, look into the references um, if you want to know more. O also, you can ask me since I, I typically have read these things, so I should know uh, approximately what, I'm, uh, what they talk about. Before I continue, is there any question? Do you, do you have any questions on, uh, on the parameterization of the force field? Yeah. 
or general questions? Yes, there's one over there. Well, in that case, yeah, you, so you're using some other tool to predict the structure, right? So using some, some so that's completely external and independent of Martini. Um, I guess, yes, I mean, technically you can. Um, there might be problems with the accuracy of what you're doing, of course. Uh, even at your lateral na level, this is, this is quite problematic. Typically people refine with uh, all atom simulations, the predictions from different bioinformatics algorithms uh, to make sure that they, at least the basic physics is, is, is correct. But uh, yeah, so in, in a way, you know, you can input uh, any information uh, into Martini because as I said, it's a bit of a toy model. So you, you, you can actually put even experimental information into your model. Uh, you could fix uh, for example, the secondary structure of the helical part of a protein and not fix the tertiary structure, so the interaction between different helices, and, and then look at what happens with that. So that, that, that's possible. And so uh, especially if you have um, infor experimental information, then you can input the experimental information into the model. More questions? Helmut. Yeah, uh, that's okay. Yeah, yes, yes. I think that's okay. Now I understand better. Okay, uh, now I understand much better. I think some people have tried that, and um, uh, the extent to which Martini can predict the tertiary structure is fairly uh, uh, limited. That's because typically regular uh, secondary structures are separated by loops. Uh, whose conformation is typically not known, and if these are long enough, then easily your structure can be trapped in some energy minimum, which is maybe not the absolute minimum, but it's stable enough uh, so that you don't see anything else. Uh, I think this has been tried um, uh, with limited success, yeah. There was another question over there, I think, no? no? Yes. <coughs> so I'm going to talk briefly about elastic networks in a few minutes. So uh, if you, yeah, if you're a little patient, we will reach that. Yes. Yeah, so I'm yes, I'm touching on. Yeah, so that so I'm gonna show a couple of slides also on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So I have a couple of slides on that, although I haven't participated in this development, but um, I will explain briefly what it is. Absolutely. So you get the answer in uh, ten minutes from now, probably. Okay. <laughs> 
okay, well then I continue with this kind of list of things you can actually do uh, safely to some extent at least. Uh, one of the things that Sievert did uh, already in 2004 when the model wasn't even called Martini uh, was um, trying to reproduce face behavior of systems with, with lipids. And he immediately noticed that, uh, for example, for this particular lipid, the OPE, he was able to reproduce uh, the spontaneous formation of inverted hexagonal phases. Um, for mixtures of these two lipids, he was able to reproduce also rhombohedral phases, which is a, a bit more exotic. In fact, I think I'm, I'm, I'm skipping one slide. Uh, uh, I, I, I think I don't have it here, but uh, he also managed to reproduce uh, most of the phase behavior of this mixture as you vary the concentration of one lipid versus the other. So they don't only form uh, rhombohedral and hexagonal phases, but also lamellar phases, depending on how much water and depending on the temperature. And uh, this is really nice because this information, which is obviously structure, was not an input. Okay, so structure was not an input, and the model is able to reproduce at least three different types of structures for the same lipids. So this is something you probably would not see or not very easily with a structure-based model. Okay? This is a clear advantage of the thermodynamics-based model because there's no information on the structure. There's only information on the thermodynamics. So that's, I think that's very cool, actually. The reason why these transformations are interesting also biologically is that these strange lipid phases are actually relevant for processes like vesicle fusion or pore formation. Hey, this is just a slide from a, from a review by Kozlov. Uh, you can see some similarity uh, with uh, these bizarre lipid phases. So it's not just a fun for you know, a physical chemist type, but it's, it's relevant for biology, the ability to reproduce phase behavior of lipids. Eh? Then a little bit more sophisticated, this is work by my friend, Yalho Risalada, uh, a few years later, uh, showing that with some particular mixture of lipids, I think this was a DPPC, uh, DOPC cholesterol or something like that, uh, you can have phase separation and this is, um, it's, it's a real thermodynamic phase separation leading to a, you know, infinite, infinitely large phases. It's an equilibrium phenomenon. And these phases look like what we expect for the so-called liquid disordered and liquid ordered uh, domains in, in so-called lipid rafts, which was, a, uh, especially a few years ago, until a few years ago, it was a very hot topic in e-membrane biology. Um, now, liquid ordered phases, uh, they have um, a larger thickness, they are more rigid, um, and, and uh, the diffusion coefficients are much less, while uh, liquid disordered phases are typically thinner, uh, with large area, uh, more flexible. And uh, this phenomenon can be reproduced quite nicely uh, with, with Martini. Now, uh, a few years later, uh, even more sophisticated type of um, uh, membrane was was finally published. Uh, again, this is a this is a uh, Siever Jan Mering and and a Tieleman group. Uh, uh, they uh, prepared systems with a very complex lipid composition. These are like 63 different lipid types <coughs> distributed asymmetrically, both in terms of the head groups. So these are the head groups in the outer leaflet and the head groups in the inner leaflet, you see the distribution is, is very different. And then also the lipid chain unsaturation in the outer versus inner leaflet is different. And, and, they, and they developed a quite sophisticated equilibration procedure uh, uh, that allowed them uh, to predict uh, the co distribution of cholesterol. Now, this is, this is a quite debated uh, in the literature because cholesterol can flip-flop quite easily, uh, actually very easily, because it flip-flops on a, on a uh, I guess, less than microsecond time scale, so you, you can, it can, you can go from one leaflet to the other, and still, uh, at least with this type of setup and this type of model, it's predicted to be enriched at the outer leaflet. Now, the outer leaflet has a higher uh, proportion of uh, saturated lipids, and also uh, among the lipid times, 
there's more sphingomyelin and, and gangliosides, which have a stronger interaction with cholesterol, and this would explain the difference in cholesterol concentration in and out. Also, they noticed uh, heterogeneities uh, in the structure, uh, but no real phase separation. Right? So there was no real phase separation, um, uh, which uh, I'm not exactly sure how well it matches experiments, because if you extract uh, membranes uh, from organisms, these, these blebs, they actually phase separate. Uh, so um, I'm not exactly sure um, how to explain that. Uh, they definitely noticed clustering of some classes of lipids, eh? typically gangliosides, which are abundant in the outer leaflet. They, they form clusters. I think these are the, the red things here. Eh? Uh, and um, this uh, phosphatidyl inositol phosphates, this PIP lipids, they typically cluster spontaneously on the inner leaflet. Now, this is a very, uh, very rich, I would say, this is probably a state of the art for what we can do now with Martini with simulations. These systems contained, I think they were about 80 nanometers in lateral size, so that means probably it's a couple of million um, uh, Martini particles, which would be 20, 22 million atoms approximately. Um, and this can be simulated for a few tens of microseconds. Eh? So this is, a, this is actually valuable. And now, uh, now we switch to proteins. Uh, I, again, I start very simple. This is one of the very first things uh, we did. Actually, this comes from an exercise from another school uh, a few years back. I, I think it's from time to time I still do this exercise. I ask the, student, the students to uh, build a protein, and I tell them this is going to be helical. Right? So it, it's the red object here. And then they put the protein in a box. Now the box is this uh, blue line, it's a cube. And then they add lipid, they, the, the, the yellow lines, and they add water, everything in random position. And then they switch go, and uh, the, 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 uh, in the system self-assembles, <coughs> uh, you see uh, progressively the, the, the yellow separates from the blue, and it's uh, uh, the membrane that separates from the water. Now you have a nice bilayer, actually, yeah, they're, they're uh, this, is, this is obviously uh, periodic. And the peptide has chosen its favorite position with respect to the membrane. Hmm? Now, if you repeat a simulation like this, uh, say, 100 times, you can actually get some statistics and say, uh, what's the probability of having an interfacial orientation versus a transmembrane mm -hmm. orientation? This is something still now uh, relatively difficult to do at the olatum level, meaning a uh, hundred simulations of a microsecond time scale, that's, that's still tough. Uh, um, but with Martini, I mean, th this, this actually takes half an hour on my laptop. Uh, so if you have a real computer, you can easily do it in, in, in a few minutes, a uh, hundred times, say. So you have just some, um, uh, and, and this actually works in most cases. Why does it work? Well, for the reasons I mentioned before, right? Uh, the position of this peptide in the system is actually dictated mostly by partitioning. Mm -hmm. So if this peptide is uh, amphipathic enough, it would like uh, to stay on top of a membrane. If it was very hydrophilic, it would probably just uh, float in the water. If it was uh, mostly hydrophobic, it, it would probably sit transmembrane. And as you, as, as you repeat the simulation many, many times, you, you actually get a good uh, statistics uh, about the orientation of the peptide. Now, this is very simple. This is a bit more sophisticated, still very old. This, this still comes from the, the original 2008 Martini paper. This is simulations of uh, Maginin-2, which is an antimicrobial peptide. Uh, it was simulated in this uh, very simple single component lipid bilayer. And at low concentration, it likes to sit in a, in a, in a, on top of a, of a membrane, so the, the parallel to the uh, interface. But then when we increase the concentration, we actually put many peptides in the system, uh, the orientation changed and it was forming some kind of pores in the membrane. So this is like a concentration dependent orientation of the peptide. I find it very cool actually, because there's obviously no information in the force field related to you know, pore forming stuff. There's no information on the structure that these things should form. It's just pure thermodynamics. Uh, again, a, a little bit more quantitative, although still super, super simple. These are like really the, the first simulations we did with Martini. Um, there's a way 
uh, to measure experimentally the orientation of peptides in membranes. And this, is, this is, typically relies on quadrupolar splittings that you can measure with deuterium NMR. And uh, of course, we can also back calculate those quadrupolar splittings from the simulations, and that's what we did. We actually ran a bunch of coarse grain simulations and a bunch of all atom simulations of exactly the same system. And uh, what you see here is the deviation uh, from the actual experimental results. And you see the deviations we were getting for the coarse grain simulations are systematically smaller than the deviations we would get with an all atom force field. You have to be careful here. It absolutely does not mean that Martini is more accurate than an atom, all atom force field. It just means that the all atom simulations are too short. Right? This is purely a sampling problem. The system is so simple, it's incredibly simple. This is a repetitive peptide sequence. It's, uh, the only reason why, the only, the only ingredient you need is like long sampling. And even if not very accurate, it's accurate enough to reproduce the actual orientation of the peptide. So that was very nice. These are all things you can, uh, you, you can do. Now, a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, this comes from uh, Marti Lohibori, uh, almost 10 years old, but they already at that time did a very uh, spectacular simulation of one particular protein. This is a mechanosensitive channel of large conductance. It's a transmembrane protein. Uh, it's been simulated many times before, but what they did now, since, since Martini is so fast compared to an all atom force field, was they put it into a liposome. Now, this is a cut through just to show that the liposome is, is full of water, and of course there's water also all around. This is a big system. Again, I think it's around a million particles, so maybe like around 10, 10 11 million atoms, I suppose. Um, and, and then they changed uh, the pressure in the liposome. That's also quite easy. You just put more water in, inside, <coughs> inside the liposome, and, and, the, and the water uh, permeation through the liposome is slow enough. So in fact, when you add more water, what happens? It's like you, you build up pressure. You have a pressure difference. The pressure grows, and as the pressure grows, it creates a tension in the membrane. And when the tension is large enough, the, the protein opens to release the water out. I find this very spectacular. This is one of my favorite simulations. Uh, what happens in a bit more detail was, was kind of like this. This is a um, side view of the protein uh, at uh, low, uh, low uh, membrane tension. Uh, and this, the, the, the tension is being increased. And if you wait long enough, uh, the protein opens completely. And now the, the, there's a water pore that allows the water out. And so the pressure is released and, 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 and the tension is also released. It's, I, I think this, this is very nice. So this is one case in which uh, the the uh, secondary structure wa was held very rigidly, but the tertiary structure was not. Oh, I, actually, I think there were some restraints on the tertiary structure, but limited ones. And it's limited enough that the, 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 the helices could move relative to one another. And now, uh, uh, there's been also uh, development for sugars. Uh, most common sugars have parameters in martini and with those you can also make polysaccharides and, and these polysaccharides self-assemble and uh, this is work by Cesar Lopez now 10 years back. Uh, more recently those sugars were used to build models for DNA. And now the model of DNA I should say has a some of the uh, shares some of the limitations of, of the protein uh, force field in that the second, the, the structure of DNA is not actually predicted. Right? So this is a, there's a limited or no predictive power on DNA structure. On the other hand, you can easily look at DNA interaction with other objects, right? DNA protein interaction, DNA lipid interaction. Uh, so that's definitely uh, something you can do. Uh, we also built uh, models for carbon nanoparticles. Uh, this is in, in part my own work uh, on fullerene and then carbon nanotubes. And then you can look at how these things interact with membranes. Like for example, uh, at one point, uh, actually we were one, one, some of the, well, one of the first groups to look at the interaction of uh, 
many uh, fuller in with membranes and we would, uh, we would see that uh, these kind of very hydrophobic carbon nanoparticles would enter easily into membranes, well, easily but over time scales which are still uh, uh, on the order of the microsecond, so you still need to have a large enough computer to do this. <coughs> and, and then once in the membrane they alter all sorts of membrane properties. Um, uh, at the, uh, yeah, later on we actually developed models for polymers, a number of industrial polymers. We have polystyrene, polyethylene, polypropylene, and several others. Uh, uh, and uh, one interesting thing regarding the polymer, polymer models is that they actually behave uh, differently depending on the solvent. Right? This, is, this is a common feature for Martini models. Um, Again, it would be extremely hard or probably impossible for a structure-based model, because eh? here we are looking at structural change as a function of solvent. It's exactly the same model with exactly the same interactions. Here in a good solvent, you see it's very, uh, the conformation is very expanded. The radius of gyration will be very large. You can simulate this for tens of microseconds so that you actually get good statistics on the radius of gyration. Uh, uh, here it's in a theta solvent, at a theta temperature, so it's very close uh, to what would happen to polypropylene in the melt. And this is in water, polypropylene being a, a, a hydrophobic uh, polymer, it's extremely calm, it collapses in water very rapidly. And, and this actually, uh, for some polymers, can be uh, validated quantitatively, particularly for polystyrene, there's quantitative data. Uh, quantitative measures for the radius of gyration and we match those measures very, very nicely. Again, the beauty of it is like that there is no information on that in the force field. Eh? The only information in the force field is thermodynamics. Ah, yes, then, then, then this is work by Giulia Rossi. Uh, with Giulia, so Giulia wanted to, um, uh, to, to see what happens when these pieces of plastic interact with membranes. And, um, and in fact, if the piece of plastic is small enough, uh, small enough being on, uh, uh, approximately eight or 10 nanometers in diameter, well then these pieces of plastic actually enter quite easily lipid membranes. And, uh, <coughs> I actually think this is, this is a, uh, one of the simulations that, that Julia did. This is a top view of the membrane. Now you have this plastic nanoparticle uh, inside the membrane, uh, I should say this is polystyrene. Polystyrene is a solid at room temperature, and it's solid also in the model, so we're fine with that. In, in, plast in, in water, uh, this, the, this, this bunch of chains uh, wiggle a little bit, but actually not much. It's really, it's really like, I would say it's rock solid when you simulate it with martini in water. Uh, and now the nano nanoparticle has entered the membrane and all of a sudden, in the membrane, it finds a more favorable environment, because eh? polystyrene is a hydrophobic polymer. The membrane interior is also hydrophobic. If the nanoparticle manages to enter, it will find a very favorable environment. And in fact, the wiggling becomes bigger and bigger. And if we're really, really patient, like I think the simulation took like three months or so, uh, uh, what, we, what you observe in, in the end is like the, the chains of the polymer actually get independent uh, of the nanoparticle. In fact, if you wait long enough, you have no longer nanoparticle. There's no nanoparticle. It's a, a liquid inside a liquid. Um, and I think this was actually the first simulation uh, of this kind. And now the subject has become actually quite, uh, quite popular with, uh, with the EU calls specifically for this type of nanoplastics and uh, plastic islands and, and, and these things are now very uh, fashionable, but we did this a uh, long time ago. Uh, yes, there is this one thing uh, that is particularly important in my view. This is like a, a super fundamental. Uh, reverse mapping. Um, nobody will deny that coarse grain models are less accurate uh, than all atom models in very many respects. I, I would say in almost every respect. Um, but then you can always run much faster coarse grain simulations. So one useful way to exploit this is to actually 
prepare and equilibrate the system at the coarse grain level and then convert it to all atom. Okay? So this is, this is what we call reverse mapping. Now over the years, many different approaches have been developed to do this. And uh, one of them developed in a group of, of, of Sievert and Marink, but there are several other approaches. This, this seems to me, I mean, I've tried it myself a bunch of times. It's, it's very solid and you get very few crashes, it, it seems. Uh, this, this is uh, extremely, extremely useful. It's, it's an extremely good use, in my opinion, of coarse graining. Eh? Once you've equilibrated, so once you um, uh, studied the long, uh, long time scale and, and long length scale behavior uh, of the system, it's a very good idea to switch to all atom, to convert it to all atom, and then study the fine details of the interaction. So this is, a, this is something I like very much. And I wonder if I should make a break here. Do you have any questions about this? Probably it was like super easy. Yes. Yes. For the, for the recording, I mean, huh? it's important that everybody can hear your voice. How's water represented? Because even in uh, atomistic models, um, it's not that complicated. Plus, if you have a box of solvent, most of the time will be spent on the water anyway. Indeed, uh, yes. So you were saying it's, it's not uh, very difficult. Uh, that, that, that's true, but it's still problematic. I think that more than 50 force fields, 50 atomistic force fields exist for water. Uh, many of them are actually in use. And the reason for that is that all of them have some weaknesses. The behavior of water is incredibly difficult to simulate even at the all atom level, uh, let alone the coarse grain level. Uh, martini water is actually probably the weakest point in martini as it reproduces only a very limited set of properties. Um, a water bead in martini represents actually four water molecules. I guess that answers your question, right? So it's like a you can imagine four water molecules that group together in one gigantic bead, which is like half a nanometer in size, so it's, it's huge. Um, and uh, there is uh, no explicit hydrogen bonding, so all level, like, you know, and this already says uh, what you can expect, of course. There's no hydrogen bonding, so there's no ordering, orientation, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, the surface tension uh, of a water vapor interface comes out really bad, <coughs> and by really bad, I mean it's, it's wrong by a factor of two. It's like, I think, I think we get something like 32, 33 millinewtons per meter when the experimental value is 72 at room temperature, so it's badly wrong. <coughs> so, so then how, how does that differ from a filter in space? Or uh, when you simulate the membrane, you put something else in the membrane um, so it's a chain of joint particles. So what's the essential difference between the membrane phase and the water phase in Martini force field? Ah, well, the interactions are different, of course. I mean, in Martini, there's 18 basic types of beads. Each bead has a different polarity, if you will, uh, which translates mostly into different Lennard-Jones parameters. So the interaction of water with water is very strong, for example, uh, uh, and it's much stronger than interaction of water with hydrophobic stuff, like the acyl chain. That makes them phase separate spontaneously. Right? The acyl chains like to interact with acyl chains. Now, of course, we know that this is not really, the, this is not really how the hydrophobic effect works. Right? Uh, there's a large component of hydrophobic effect that is entropic. And that is not the way things work in Martini. Yeah, so we know that some of the physics is, is, is wrong. Yeah, it's obviously wrong. Yeah. But, but still you get the phase behavior, which, I mean, for a certain range of problems, we consider it good enough. Yeah. So these things phase separate, you form membranes, not only, but you can also form inverted hexagonal, rhombohedral phases, even cubic phases, all sorts of bizarre phases. Like, Mices, micelles, bicells, tubula, my, I mean, all sorts of crazy things form correctly in Martini. Even if the surface tension is wrong, there's no hydrogen bonding, there's no orientational order, blah, 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 okay? 
also be because keep in mind, as Lucas said, that there is no partial charge, so there's also an integral charge. So in that sense, these are try to be implemented, included into the Leonard Jones potential. Absolutely. And in addition, also uh, there is also in this sense future development to improve the water for as far as I know, like teeny water molecules in which you have a ratio that is no one to four or one to two or one to three. This something because of course the presence of water can be also important in a binding site, for instance, for a protein. Yeah, so this absolutely. is something that yes. I think. Uh, it's uh, on the table, and but still, of course, there are some components that are neglected so far. So that's that's. We have to pay a cost for to in order to 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 reach some lo lo longer time scale. That's the mm -hmm. point. Other curiosity, <coughs> further questions. Of course, the talk will continue, but in, uh, for this part, if you want to ask, please. Um, I mean, what about uh, uh, including uh, small organic molecules in these models? Is it possible to? Of course, so we can't uh, accurately describe uh, um, microsop microscopic features of the system, but uh, it could be interesting to observe uh, the effect of a small molecule on huge systems like that. Uh, absolutely. So uh, a fair number of small molecules have already been modeled in Martini. There's even efforts by, if I well remember, it's Tristan Béraud, uh, to make a, an automatic uh, procedure for parameterizing all sorts of small molecules, for example, of pharmaceutical interest. Eh? So you input uh, atomistic structures and some properties, and the output is a Martini model with these features. Uh, it's, it's automatic. Uh, I have no experience with that, so I won't speak more about that, uh, but I know it exists. Um, in general, that's, you know, the model uses a building block approach. That means it's Lego. You can just put together the beads that represent uh, your small molecule, and most of the effort will be, well, the first effort is just finding bonded interactions so that the structure is not completely crazy. And then actually the real problem starts when you, you the first simulation you do, it explodes, of course. Um, and, and then you notice that the, there's an interplay between bonded interactions and non-bonded interactions. That's extremely difficult to fix, particularly for large molecules. Like for polymers, this is actually quite a, quite a nightmare. So when we actually started uh, making models for polymers, we realized this, and uh, we finally decided that long-range structural properties of polymers should be used as a target so that's one case in which we explicitly stress that structural properties go into the Martini model because there's no other way uh, to reproduce the experimental behavior. So uh, for small molecules, that's, that's a bit less critical, but there always is an interplay between bonded and non-bonded interactions, and that's the difficult part of the job when you parameterize something. I'm gonna speak a little bit more about this later uh, when I talk about the problems, yeah, limitations. I, don't, I, I think at the end I have a slide that might interest you. Very good question. Anyway, we are actively working in the field uh, in my lab, so it's still it's in infancy. There are some examples, but still, uh, it's, it's, it's a point where to go, the parameterization of small molecule. So we'll see. So, we can continue. Now, question for, for you all. Would you like to take a five minutes break, or I conclude? No, I, I think we just wait. Yeah, so this has been so, so light and easy that, I mean, you're, uh, you can you know, like you switch off your brain a couple of minutes, and I'm still on the same stuff, so yeah. Okay, <coughs> okay, <coughs> now this slide has no title because typically the students uh, to whom I teach, they get scared. I teach to biology students, as, as you probably guessed. Uh, uh, they, they get scared when, when I show the title of the slide, so I don't show any title. Um, now, th th this, is a, this is a very simple uh, model of, let's say, some liquid. Uh, it's a small simulation box, there's eight particles, uh, actually atoms, let's call them atoms, eh? okay? And because this is, um, now we are typically interested in, uh, uh, in liquids actually, there's very many uh, uh, equivalent configurations of the system in which we just switch around uh, the particles. Actually, do you know how many possible configurations? How many possible? It's like eight particles, therefore, eight factorial possible ways to arrange them. <coughs> and now, let's coarse grain this. So we coarse grain, we coarse grain into, 
the Martini way. So it's a one to four ratio. Now we have only two particles. Now how many permutations do we have? Well, that's two factorial, so that's two. Um, now, um, the number of ways to arrange uh, particles in a system is related to the entropy of the system. So by cold-graining, you're actually reducing the entropy of the system, which was the title of the slide that, that my students don't like. Um, um, now, what happens with this? If the entropy in a cold grain system is less, then probably also the change in entropy in whichever phenomenon you're looking at is different from the change in entropy that you would have in an atomistic simulation. Uh, typically, the change in entropy is less. Right? Typically, the change of entropy is less. And since uh, the coarse-grained uh, potential, that the coarse-grained property that we was used as a target is a free energy, delta G, and since this delta S is probably wrong, the implication of it would be that even this delta G, as you change temperature, will probably be wrong. Right? So your temperature dependence of the properties is probably, is probably off. Um, notice that this is independent of Martini. I mean, this is just reduction of degrees of freedom in a system. Um, um, I should also say probably, oop, no, uh, sorry, apologize for this. Let's go on this, this, this and this. There was something else I wanted to say about this slide. Um, if your entropy is wrong, it also means that most likely your enthalpy will be wrong. Okay? So uh, um, for this type of models, which are based on some free energy, um, other thermodynamic properties are often wrong. Hmm? And this, I think, is quite general feature of coarse grain models. And this is what we expect. Um, uh, and this just r repeats the stuff I, 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 just, I just said. Um, not only the enthalpy is wrong, but also, typically, the free energy for other phenomena, free energy change for other phenomena. So free energy of, I don't know, vaporization. Right? In Martini, the, the free energy for vaporization is wrong. Mm, okay? Because it was not parameterized to reproduce it. Martini was parameterized to reproduce a free energy of transfer. Mm? <clears throat> um, limited transferability, what, what does it mean? As you change the environment compared to the environment that you used during the parameterization, eh, then you might have problems. Environment, uh, by that I mean also temperature, pressure conditions. As you change that, you might go into trouble. Um, uh, third, Again, this is common for all coarse grain models. Uh, the surfaces of the molecules are now much smoother. If they are smoother, uh, you should expect limitations in applications like docking, for example. Mm -hmm. okay. So you, you now have these big spheres uh, sliding against each other, and they're much bigger than atoms. Um, the, the, the shape complementarity can't be as good as in all atoms. So that's a, it might work, but it might also not work. Um, the kinetics is altered. Again, very general, very general. This is, this is obviously altered because your fringe landscape looks like the red one in comparison to the blue one. Right? Now the fringe number of fringe minima in the, in, in the system is much less. Your system is going to move faster. Right? Um, and now some more specific limitations for the Martini model. These are like specific for Martini, meaning some other models might do better. Or if you, if you, if you want to try yourself to develop a cosmic model, you, 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 you may uh, well have ideas on how to solve these things. First one is electrostatics. That very much relates to your previous question on water. Eh? So uh, electrostatics is, of, of course, important for water. Um, and we don't have any electrostatic on water in Martini, so that's, uh, that's problematic. And then regarding proteins, there were several drawbacks. Uh, some of them we, we knew immediately, um, and some of them we realized only later. Like, for example, uh, the structure is not always well reproduced. Well, that's obvious, because we chose not to have structure as a target. 
Um, secondary structure change, uh, impossible, that also means you can't unfold. So you, 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 in Martini, in a standard Martini at least, uh, you cannot do those beautiful simulations that Helmut has shown where he pulls on, on proteins and, and, and they unfold and this yeah, it just won't happen because it's a harmonic potential. So as you pull, uh, the, the force keeps increasing. Uh, so that, that just won't work. Um, uh, this we knew from beginning, of course. Uh, something we realized later on um, um, was excessive stickiness. That means um, uh, we actually were not sure about this for a really long time. I think now we start to have some uh, more reasonable experimental data and especially uh, all atom data showing that martini proteins tend a bit too much. I'll show you something on, on these aspects. So first of all, water. This is the uh, standard water model, just one uh, Lena Jones bead. Uh, later on, uh, the group of Sever Yan developed uh, a polarizable water model. In a polarizable water, you actually have one Lena Jones center, which is still this one, and then two centers for electrostatic interactions. And you have a, an angle potential in between the two charges. Um, <coughs> And uh, uh, of course, that, that, that means the dipole can change. Right? The, you, you have a variable dipole, and in that, in that sense, uh, also, also this dipole can reorient. So it, it, this, this, is a, this is polarizable in that sense. Um, this fixes some problems with the electrostatics. Like, for example, the free energy of transfer of ions, which used to be like really bad, um, improved significantly. Now, let me comment a minute on this. What, what I'm showing here is a free energy uh, of transfer of two ions, a sodium ion and a chloride ion, as a function of the distance from the center of a lipid membrane. So this will be the center of a lipid membrane. Obviously, ions don't want to go to the center of a lipid membrane, so the energy uh, in the center is always higher than in water. But with the early Martini model, uh, the penalty to pay for the ions to enter was really low, like really, really low. And then with a the polarizable model, uh, both using simple cutoffs and using PME as, a, as an algorithm for electrostatics, you get significantly higher uh, free energies of transfer, which are much more realistic. So at least this type of phenomenon is reproduced a bit better. What you can do with it is, for example, electroporation. Uh, this, this, of course, did not work with the, with the non-polarizable models, but with a polarizable model, you can actually apply an electric field, like in this case, it's a constant electric, electric field oriented along the normal to the membrane, and this would very rapidly generate a water pore, like a giant water pore, and this actually works with a, with a, with a polarizable water model. Now, I don't have slides um, to show you, yes? Just a curiosity. Here in this model, you have still a one to four mapping. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well. Well. Yeah. One to four, if you consider the Lena Jones center, but it's it's three particles now. Yeah. That's the point. So that's it, the point. It, it, yeah, for Lena Jones center, is one to four. Okay. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, it, um, I want to stress th that this does not solve every problems every problem with the electrostatics in Martini. Like for example, <laughs> ah, sorry. Um, my colleagues in Genova have noticed, and, and others as well actually, um, uh, have noticed significant problems or significant discrepancies between the results of Martini models on nanoparticles, so larger objects with many, many charges, um, as they get absorbed onto uh, membrane surfaces. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is actually, um, it's actually very problematic. So you get very different results, whether you simulate them at the all atom level or the standard martini or the polarizable martini. And both the standard and the polarizable give the wrong results. So that's, that's problematic. Unfortunately, I can't show you this because it's unpublished results. But it's just to mention that it, it's not that the polarizable water model solves every problem of the electrostatics. It's n not at all. It's, it's an improvement. but but. Um, but also it makes the interaction of charged species with polarizable water very strong. 
and that can be a problem. That, that, that can be too strong. That it's so strong that they don't interact anymore with other charged stuff, like charged lipids, for example. That's, that's, that's problematic. Um, now, elastic networks. So some of you were asking about elastic networks, networks earlier. There's two standard approaches. Um, there's two approaches in Martini for elastic networks. A first one, we call it a standard elastic network. Um, uh, the bond force constants can be tuned. Um, we have tools to generate um, ITP files, so topologies for proteins in Martini. Uh, this tool is called Martinize. Um, can generate elastic networks with different force constants, so you, you can tune them. And typically, it, it generates bonds for everything uh, within a certain cutoff, which is also uh, customizable. Um, uh, this sort of network was always used in beta sheets, uh, so to preserve the structure of a beta sheet, and also to some extent to preserve tertiary structure of proteins. Um, a little bit later, Another approach was published, it's called El Nedin. This is the work of Xavier Periol. Um, and in this case, the bonds are created only on backbone B, not on all B. Uh, also, the backbone was located on the carbon alpha uh, and not in the center of mass of the backbone. That implies differences in backbone, backbone distances and backbone side chain distances. So the model actually looks quite different in terms of bonded interactions. It turns out, uh, oh, okay, and third, the difference, um, uh, Xavier applied these type of elastic bonds also to helices, so both helices and uh, beta sheets. Uh, now, the result of it uh, was that this el Nedin is actually much more effective at preserving uh, the secondary structure, or actually the structure in general for proteins. And here you see the RMSD, along a uh, relatively short simulation, 100 nanoseconds. You see the, the green is actually the el Nedin simulation, and the RMSD is much, much lower. So this is, this is probably the best you can do to preserve a secondary structure, which you probably have taken from x-rays uh, or some other high-resolution uh, structural technique. There's, um, <coughs> there's also this other approach that, that's much more recent. Um, uh, and, 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 and I think they, they, they called it Go Martini because it, it's, uh, it reminds of the Go model uh, for protein folding. So in, in Go models, you actually build a contact map which is based on uh, distances between amino acids and, and you, and you uh, consider a contact uh, when two amino acids in a crystal structure are close enough. Um, and then instead of having elastic bonds, you have Lana Jones interactions. So Lana Jones interactions don't grow to infinity as the, as the, as the bond length increases, right? They actually uh, flatten out. So with this type of approach, you can actually do those, those AFM simulations in which you break, you break the, the structure of the protein so the proteins can unfold. Also, in principle, uh, you can fold um, small proteins at least from scratch. This is actually works for peptides. So I think these simulations were all started from, you see, completely unfolded structures and, and they uh, ended up producing some uh, very reasonable folds, both in beta sheets and alpha helices. Eh? So, of course, it's also, th 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 there's, uh, there's no prediction at all here. You must have uh, the information on the secondary structure from experiment. But still, it actually extends the, the, the range of applications that you, can, that you can have with Martini. There's been also another uh, development one year later by the same group um, uh, using a mix of elastic bonds and Leonard Jones interactions in this contact map. Uh, and, and in this case, they, they really were able to reproduce, uh, I, I guess, semi-quantitatively, this forced extension curves that are uh, generated by AFM pooling. I won't say more because I'm really not a specialist of this. And I, 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 I'm, yes, I don't know the details of, of this model. Um, there's another couple of uh, problems I want to, I have a few minutes, yes. Um, a couple of limitations that I wanted to mention uh, with Martini, and they relate to uh, 
uh, one detail that I mentioned in the beginning, the fact that there is no size-dependent Lennard-Jones parameters. Eh? The Lennard-Jones parameters are, are fixed. There's only uh, three Lennard-Jones sigmas uh, in Martini, uh, at least in the current version, which most people use. Um, and uh, one of the artifacts um, that come from that uh, is artificial barriers for the dimerization of two objects. And this, this simply comes from the fact that the, the small beads and tiny beads interact with the regular beads uh, with a sigma of 0.47, so with a large sigma. This preserves partitioning to some extent, but it definitely um, uh, generates artifacts when you look at barriers. So here we're looking at a PMF, so a free energy as a function of the distance between these two objects, which are rings. And as, as, they, as they get close, um, the atomistic simulations, so OPLS or GROMOS, these ones, uh, you see there's a minimum here and there's a very tiny barrier here, while all coarse grain models have larger barriers and actually uh, <coughs> the barriers get larger as the beads get smaller. So that's that, that, that problem. That's an artifact, clearly. Uh, another one that is actually even more important is that when you have really short bonds, what actually happens is that the density of particles increases, obviously. So the density of energy in the system also increases. And, and this actually leads to um, uh, even phase separation phenomena. Uh, between objects that should not face separate at all, like, <coughs> sorry. I think this is uh, two molecules, uh, two um, hydrocarbons. This is dodecane, and this is a uh, uh, diene, so dodeca diene, uh, that will be, that will represent uh, the acyl chain you have in a uh, doubly unsaturated um, uh, phospholipids. Um, as um, the bonds get shorter, you actually get a phase separation, which is completely, uh, it's a complete artifact, of course. Um, uh, in this case, it's even worse than you might think. The short bond distances arise from small force constants binding the beads. Eh? <coughs> so the force constant, if it's small enough, as the beads you know, diffuse in the box and bump into each other, the average distance gets less if the force constant is weak. As, a, as the distance gets less, the, the system phase separates, as you see here. This, is, this reports a relative number of contacts as a function of the force constant. So you're just changing a force constant. That's, that's what I meant with interplay between bonded and non-bonded interactions. That's completely crazy, but this happens, and we didn't know until not so long ago. One of the consequences is this, which is also, there's all the unpublished results. <coughs> this is actually by my student, uh, Vincent, who is in the audience in the back. Ciao, Vincent. So uh, he was showing, this is, a, this is a PMF, so potential mean force, uh, or if you prefer, a free energy here as a function of the distance between two peptides. Actually, the two peptides are these ones. They are identical. They are WALP-23 peptides. This is a very, very commonly used model peptide. Eh? As, you, as, you, as you bring them together, there's a certain attraction. Um, which you see here, and the depth of this minimum, I'm not sure if you can read, but it's about 30 kilojoules per mole, so there's a significant attraction, which implies that if you simulate, say, 100 of these peptides in a large box, they will basically aggregate quite uh, spontaneously, quite heavily, uh, which is not correct. In fact, uh, with, with, with the new model that we're working on, uh, together with, with a group of Sievert, of course, uh, we finally managed to reproduce a much weaker binding between the two peptides. Eh? Now you see this, um, uh, there's always an attractive interaction, uh, so a negative uh, free energy at the point of contact between the two peptides, uh, 
but this difference is only six kilojoules per month. So this is, it's very weak. It's like, it's less than three times KT. So that's, um, it's a very weak binding. Uh, now, um, I won't tell you more details, but I mean, we, we are in the process of writing up the paper on this, uh, which contains the entire <coughs> New force, new version of the force field, the Martini three force field. The, Mar the Martini three force field has actually been out and available for everybody to test already for like maybe one year, I guess. Uh, but there's there's substantially no, no paper out because we're still trying to refine this, and, uh, and we keep finding uh, more. Pro I think now we're at the end of the process, uh, and I'm also at the end of the talk. I think this is this is it. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Luca. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna die before the end of this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that time for question, and then after the question time, we have the announcement for the first poster, poster presentation. So stay in the room with just a little time more. Questions? We had already on some of them during the talk, but if you still have some curiosity or question, just let us know. No? Everything's clear, or just simply tired? Uh, Okay, so no question, just some last comment that I may have since uh, we are starting to see Martini cause grain, you know. So this thickness issue that uh, still exists, at least I tell you how we, since we, we do a lot of dynamic simulation, how we try to, to overcome a little bit, no? uh, partially at least this limitation. We combine cause grain, Martini for large system with metadynamics. In doing so, we are able to see many uh, unbinding, for instance, between the proteins or helices. In doing so, uh, uh, well, the message maybe uh, could be given to the students that you can use this kind of method that, of course, are inaccurate, as you fairly, uh, honestly, uh, underline uh, for many properties, but it's the only way to, to study particular features for very large systems. So you can use this as a kind of sampling of the phase space, and then just get the most interesting states, and you can back mapping or reverse mapping into atomistic structures. Maybe Something, a, a strategy that may be useful also for you for some of your studies if you want to explore some very complex long time scale large in large systems events it's a possibility to have at least a very rough overview of what's going on what do you think about that no, no, absolutely I mean this, this is a, it's a, I think it's a very wise way of using coarse grain models and you use them for large scale features of your system use a coarse grain model and then convert to a latum uh, to get the details right I think there's a lot of work by many groups. Now, if I mention them, I mean, I'm, uh, the fact that I'm on YouTube really uh, <laughs> poses some, okay. If, if I mention some and I don't mention others, they get offended. But I remember work by, by Mark Sansom on this, for example. I think that's that's very nice use of course graining. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, as a tech message, this uh, could be uh, something. Yeah, them absolutely. Th this is being done. Try, yeah. you know, Martini, yeah. so they look at your slides, yeah. so yeah. pros and cons. But still, it's yeah. good to give yeah. some guidelines. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that, that still, um, I think it, it's still necessary for us to make improvements on the thermodynamics. Eh? Because if, if at one point uh, we, we get the wrong equilibrated system, then, then there might be no point in converting to all atom because you start from the, from the wrong structure. And the all atom might not be able to fix uh, this. Eh? So, uh, um, just uh, the, the time scales you can tackle with a lot of simulations are typically a bit shorter. Um, just last question, one, tell me just one major improvement that you think it's, it's really necessary, the first one, in terms of priority. I think there the are many, but the I first think one. The, the, the last slide I showed you, the fact that we finally managed to fix the stickiness. The stickiness, I always hear, <coughs> it's a problem of proteins. Martini proteins are sticky, blah, blah, blah. And, and of course, I mean, I take the blame for it since I was the main one no, working, working on this. In fact, uh, this nice paper that just came out by Riccardo Alessandri shows that it's not at all a problem of the proteins. It's a problem of the short bonds. Okay? So sugars have the same problems. Nanoparticles have the same problem. DNA has the same problem. Um, th the fact that we finally managed to tackle the stickiness problem for me, that, that's huge because it, it makes it clear that now interactions between two Martini objects are much more realistic, like significantly more, really. I think this Martini 3 will make a, a, a big 
change. It's a step change. Uh, hi, thank you for the lovely talk. Uh, so since you were mentioning DNA, and I was, I was wondering whether I should ask this because I think it's kind of a naive question, but what about DNA with Martini? Because I work with protein and DNA complexes, I work with the nucleosome, and people very often approach me and they tell me, why don't you use Martini? I don't even know if I can use it on my system. So I just, I wanted to ask you what about that? What about DNA with Martini? But I, as usual, as usual <coughs> it just depends on the question you're asking. So the, the question you ask to the model. Eh? Uh, uh, Martini has, as far as I know, no predictive power on the structure of DNA. So if the question you're asking, if the problem you're trying to tackle is about the structure of DNA, I think you're out of luck. I think you should not. Uh, if instead it's about interaction of DNA with something else, uh, then particularly the Martini 3 version, ver version 3 of the model, that really can help. Like protein DNA, for example, protein DNA interaction, uh, I think now is going to become much more realistic. Still keep in mind that the interface, I mean the surfaces of these objects are very different from the surface of an all atom representation. So um, again, it might be used for like a preliminary screening of interactions. More or less the same way we use docking. Eh? Docking is, uh, has been shown a million times. It does not reproduce at all the, the free energy of interaction of objects, but still it's quite good at guessing the, the relative orientation of two objects. So it's, it's um, I think that, that's how people use it nowadays. Yeah, right? yeah. I may, I may be, me no, wrong, no, no, you're correct, right. You, I mean, we, you, also, we also see some presentation docking this, this, this call. I think the, 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 the message is always the same. I say, I, I say this message during my talk. There is no middle that, uh, that supports another. So the point that you have to choose, you have to choose the middle based on the research that you have to carry. Mm. So if you have to create thousands of ligands, you cannot do that. You're using a chemical perturbation or whatever. Exactly. So you need to use something that is fast, less mm. accurate. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the point is that choose the middle that fits better on, on the system that you have question, to start. Yeah. So that's, yeah, same message. You might use Martini for preliminary screening of uh, DNA protein interaction, and then once you know that more or less probably my piece of DNA goes uh, on this side of the protein, then you convert it to a atom and actually do something in, in more detail, look at this interaction in more detail. So, Also, DNA lipid interaction is being looked at. I think there's a couple of papers so there's one that came out last week, I think, by Tielemann again. I uh, can't remember if it's DNA or RNA, because I suspect now there's also an RNA model, but I, I just don't have enough time to read. <laughs> I, I remember that you are it's online. It's, it's, it's a shame, <laughs> but uh, okay. No, okay. Okay, uh, for the question, otherwise we move on with the post announcement of poster winner prize. So, no other question, no further question. Let me thank again Luca. Thanks. And uh, all the speakers of this morning session, of course, let me just call on the stage Daniele and uh, Francesco, the other co-organizer for the announcement of the best poster presentation award. And uh, uh, the microphone is now is in the hands of Daniele, then he's going to make an announcement. And it's also a gift, I would say, a present. Oh? Um, so uh, we are really glad and to give the best post uh, presentation award to Vincent Nieto. I don't know if the pronounce is correct, but So this is the so the poster top the, the topic the topic is simulation of lipid droplets. So and uh, uh, this is this the is a typical Swiss present, I would say. Huh? <laughs> okay. So again, so thank you. Congratulations.
lunch time. See you at 2 p.m. in the computer room 156. Thank you.